Okay, why don't we go ahead and get started? Uh, it's uh, it's nine o'clock. It's uh, good to see so many familiar faces. Some people I've seen haven't seen for ages. Some people I see on Skypes just about every day, or on Zooms. Uh, I hope everybody's doing well. This is obviously an unusual time uh, we're going through, uh, but it's great to be able to use the technology to connect and find ways to sort of share what we're doing. Um, I'm sure you all have really good stories uh, and we're looking forward to hearing some of those a little bit later, uh, but we're gonna just jump right in, I think, to uh, to our speakers. Uh, I wanted to first invite some of the uh, the CSUN Science Learning Collaboratory if you want to just say hi and introduce yourselves. I didn't introduce myself. I'm Brian Foley. I'm a professor in uh, secondary education at CSUN. I think I know a lot of you guys. Um, Ginny, you want to say hi? Hi, I'm Ginny Vandergon and I'm a professor over in the Department of Biology at CSUN and part of this lovely team that's helping put this on today. We're all wearing our shirts, I think. Which side? <laughs> I guess I could go next. My name is Dorothy. I teach in the chemistry and biochemistry department, and I've been with these wonderful people for a number of years also. My name is Norm, and I've been around uh, Northridge for quite a long time, and this is a great group to work with. Hey, I'm Matthew D'Alessio, and uh, we'll see how things go today. My internet connection has been terribly unstable, but I'm looking forward to joining you as much as we can. Hello, my name is Lee. Uh, I have this shirt, which means I'm part of the group. Uh, I'm from chemistry department. Uh, nice to see you today. I hope everybody will learn a lot today. And my name is Michelle. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Uh, my name is Michelle. I'm the grant coordinator uh, with these wonderful genius uh, scientists and um, professors. So I'm here to help. Fantastic. All right. Well, everybody, uh, let's just uh, talk a little bit about how, we, how we're going to do this. Uh, we have a number of excellent talks lined up. Uh, I think what we're going to do is we're going to um, for the most part, use the chat to ask questions, and then we'll sort of the as sort of moderators, we'll be sort of monitoring the chat uh, box and and uh, and maybe relay those to whoever is speaking, um, and uh, so we can also use our uh, our reactions. Uh, so at the end of the talks, um, we can go ahead and uh, hit the applause icon. It looks a little bit like this. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Because uh, we want to let the speakers know we appreciate what they're doing. Um, but we're also going to have time at the end to sort of chat with uh, with speakers. We have the um, several discussion rooms open. If you have a, a burning question you want to ask somebody, go ahead and use uh, the private chat. You can chat privately to anybody on the list. Uh, and Or you can uh, have, meet them in one of the discussion rooms and, uh, and talk more at that point. Um, if they're able to do that. Um, let's see, other than that, I think we'll just uh, go ahead and get started. Anything I'm forgetting? Um, yeah, the, so for the speakers, we're gonna, Michelle will be timing you, um, and at 10 minutes, the, the timer will go off, and then we'll ask that you wrap up, because as you can see from our agenda, we have a lot that we're gonna try to uh, get through. And if you want any of us to come to any of the speakers from the talks to come to the conference uh, to the breakout rooms, just uh, private chat them and then they can pop in. Um, I'm happy to pop in and out of the room when I'm not presenting if people have questions or clarifications. Everybody feel good about it. All, all good. All right. All right. Uh, we're going to we're going to kick it off uh, with Deb Bennett. Deb, I'm going to turn it over to you. Hi, I'm Debbie Bennett. I teach uh, chemistry and environmental science over at Calabasas High School, and we've been using Zoom for about three weeks now. So I am not any more an expert than any of you, so if I miss something or if you know something I don't know, please feel free to chime in and um, more of a discussion and less of a talk, hopefully. Um, so one of the things that we are going to, well, the only thing we're going to demonstrate this morning is the use of breakout rooms. 
and breakout rooms are really awesome. And if Brian can turn this over to me. Yeah, I'm, I'm not seeing the option to do that right now. Okay, mm. then Brian, why don't you just put everybody in breakout rooms in just a minute? Okay, sure, I will. So Brian's gonna put you into breakout rooms. Um, introduce yourself. Matthew's host though. Hey, I'm sorry, Dave, um, Matt. Matt's host. Oh, so it, oh. Can, Matt, can Matt make me? Matt, no, yeah, Matt? Or Matt. Okay, so when you get into your, oh, cool. I am the host now. When you get into your breakout room, I'm gonna put you in the rooms of three or four people. Introduce yourselves. Uh, what do you teach? Where do you teach? And what is working for you? All right, so I am going to, actually four or five. All right, so you're all gonna go into a breakout room. So go ahead and click the join button if you see it. Hey, so you guys got a little longer than we thought opportunity to talk to one another. Um, did you notice the ask for help button at the bottom? So when you have your students in these breakout rooms, they can raise their hand and ask for help. And then you'll get a little blurb in your, um, on your screen that says, Susie Smith in breakout room four is asking for help. And do you wanna join? And then you just press the button and you go and you talk to Susie Smith. Um, so it's really nice. You have the facility to put the kids in rooms. You can visit all the rooms. Um, obviously you would not have this hosting issue because you would be the only host and you would set it up that the kids can't claim host. So you wouldn't have this issue, you'd have full control of the breakout rooms. Okay, so let me just, oh, hosts also disabled screen sharing. Sorry, I am trying, I'm, hey, I am <laughs> trying to get it off of my iPad as host. I might get it off right now. Okay. All right. So, um, you see, we're laughing. One of my slides, if you could see them, um, actually says- Matt is host right now. <laughs> okay. It says, don't be afraid to make mistakes. Um, you see, we're all laughing. You have relationships with your students. Um, I'm so grateful that if this were going to happen, it happened at the end of the year and not at the beginning when you know your students and you have relationships with them. And they were telling me that uh, uh, one of their teachers was trying to use breakout rooms and threw everybody off the conference. And they just thought it was hilarious. And with the boredom and the stress and everything that, that's going on, something that's just hilarious is just a really good thing, even if it just means that you messed up your Zoom conference. Um, as you saw, you got a chance to talk and socialize. Normally in the classroom, um, really draconian, stay on task, stay on task, stay on task. But our students need this opportunity just to talk to one another. So even if they're off task, giving them four or five minutes to in small groups just to chat about their day and to share pictures of their pets and and all that is just really important um, formative assessment this is the only way I have really figured out to get any kind of authentic feedback is um, by doing this so um, okay. I the time the timer has gone off and Okay. I'm switching it to my voice because I don't think you guys can hear it. I'm sorry. <laughs> so Matt Thank has you. a screenshot of what a host breakout room would look like when you open it up. What the host look at like? Yeah. I, yeah. That's what that's what the host sees. Um, and so I I have some uh, I have a PowerPoint that has some screen share screenshots that I will forward to Brian and he can post it, which is more of a how to. Um, do this, but as the host, you can join any room you want to, and you see the names of all the people in each individual room. And you can bop around as the host. Uh, Debbie, there's a question about Zoom bombing. Do we have advice for people to prevent Zoom bombing? Um, yes, but we're kind of really out of time. Um, Zoom has a lot of security features. So Zoom was created for the business world, right? It wasn't created to give to teenagers. But you can require authentication. Um, you can require a waiting room where each individual has to get approved by you before they can join. You can knock participants out. You can prevent private commenting so that the students 
can private comment you and can comment to everyone, but they can't send Susie a chat that you can't see, right? So Johnny can't bully Susie because I can't send the chat. Um, you can prevent screen sharing. Um, this is the security feature that is preventing me from sharing my PowerPoint because I'm not the host. So I can't just throw anything up on the screen that I want to, only the host, um, the way I have this set up, uh, can put stuff on the screen. Yeah, we, we've learned something new about Zoom today that uh, if you make multiple people hosts, that the host uh, mantle seems to float around. Um, so Matthew is currently the host. Um, all right. Uh, thank you, Debbie. Uh, I think uh, uh, that was fabulous. Should we give her a, a round of reactions? All right. Thank you. Um, do you want me, Brian, to go to that other room in case people have other questions? Um, I, I don't know if anyone's going to be there, but if somebody wants to do that, uh, you could check it out and see, or people can use the private chat if they have questions. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you. All right. Let's move right along to Ryan Haney. Let's see. I'm going to unmute you. There you go. Oh, I'm host again. All right, hi everybody, I'm Ryan Haney. I teach biology at Lucky Gata High School. And today I just wanted to share with you uh, how EdSumble could be used to do digital lectures and some tweaks for that to make it a little more interactive. Ryan, is there, we're getting a lot of static on your audio. Is there something we can do? Um, let's see. Oh, I figured it out. How's that, is that better? Much. Oh my God, so much better. There we go. It picked up the mic on my earbud instead of my computer. All right, so I'll just do that again. Hi everyone, I'm Ryan Haney. I teach biology at La Quinata High School. And today I just wanted to share with you how Edpuzzle could be used um, to do your direct instruction, but also how to make it more interactive and have it mirror closer to what you would normally do in the physical classroom. Let's see if I can get share screen to work. Bonus. Awesome, there we go. Great, so for those of you unacquainted with Edpuzzle, Edpuzzle is an online platform that lets you add some point of interaction to your own screencast. So to use it, first thing you wanna do is record a screencast. There's a lot of different ways you can do that. You can use Screencastify, QuickTime. Also, iPhones and iPads already have a built-in screen recording function. So if you, either of those devices, you can jump right in. You're then gonna upload that screencast to Edpuzzle. And it'll give you an ability to add in multiple points of interaction for your students. So you can add multiple choice questions, pre-response, and what I found to be most powerful is the note function. Because in the note function, you can drop links throughout your screencast. And of course, the part we always enjoy as teachers is you can use it to hold students accountable. They can be assigned your uh, screencast on Edpuzzle through Google Classroom, and you can prevent them from being able to skip through the video. They have to watch the entire thing to progress through. So this is great for its typical use with just passive direct instruction, but there's so much more we do in the physical classroom than just that. We facilitate discussion, we're demonstrating and explaining tasks, encouraging collaborative data collection, and providing support and feedback. So I just wanted to share ways you can weave in Google Forms, Sheets, Docs, and digital labs to try to capture all of those components that are more challenging in a digital landscape. You can absolutely still teach using phenomena with Edpuzzle. What I found is you can screencast a YouTube video that's playing or a GIF and still be able to capture that going on. So right here, I just have a phenomena of CO2 moving around the world. Uh, you can add in open-ended questions. And if that doesn't work, you can also just put a direct link to the video of the phenomena you want your students to watch and do that through the note function. To try to capture collaborative discussion with phenomena, if you, in the note function, put a link to a Google Sheet, you can have places for students to respond. That way they can at least see what other students are responding true and try to engage with each other that way. You, you can make it kind of like a hyper doc in the way we would normally use it with Google Docs with links to other things. So if you were to screencast an explanation or a demonstration of a lab, something you would normally do in the classroom physically, you can walk through each all of the steps and then drop a link through that note function to that digital lab to encourage students to go around and play around with it. But then oftentimes you'll have that dilemma of, well, you want to explain with them what they saw. 
if in your screencast you include what you will the results would be in that digital lab, you can then have them return to the Edpuzzle and discuss what happened. So in this example, I just have a digital lab on ecological populations, two species of plant grow, and then when they play around with it, hopefully they'll see one species took over the entire area, the other species isn't there anymore. So by having them return to that Edpuzzle, you can do that follow-up feedback portion of trying to pull it to the principle that the digital lab's trying to teach them. You can also use it for collaborative data collection. If in your first ed puzzle you provide them a Google form or some kind of link where they're collecting data, then in the second ed puzzle you'll have that data that they've submitted and then you can have them go through that collaborative data and review it with them through the ed puzzle. It's great for showing them too how to create graphs, how to analyze graphs and data obtained from that collaborative activity. It can also be used for providing feedback on assessments. So that's definitely been a challenge for me. How do I review the exams and assessments that I'm giving them digitally? Using Edpuzzle, you can take the five, ten questions they miss the most, put that as part of your screencast, and have them engage with it at a higher level. You can list points of interaction for reflection and metacognition. So on the bottom right with this question, I'm just asking them, well, why is this question incorrect? those multiple points are there to try to make sure they're going through the material and trying to recreate the normal classroom experience as much as you can. And another unique thing you can do with that puzzle is with student presentations. If they're all sharing out data from their experiment or are going to give a presentation on the topic, students can create ed puzzles. They can create their own ed puzzles. They can do those points of interaction, submit them to you, and then you can take them and then assign them to the class so they're still able to see the presentations of their peers and receive feedback. And that's all I have. Hopefully that's helpful in just some further ways that you can use that puzzle to try to recreate what we'd be doing in the classroom. I'm going to suggest that we all put, for all of us speakers, that we on our last slide go ahead and throw our emails on so that people can um, direct questions to you later if they're trying some of this too. Um, just a suggestion um, for all of us. Thank you, Ryan. Sure. Did you see that there were a few questions about um, a puzzle and that maybe Ryan can answer? How is this different from Google Docs? Um, Ed puzzles different in that in a couple ways. So you're recording the screencast, you're uploading it on the Ed Puzzle. They have to watch the entire video, and then Ed Puzzle gives you the feedback of when a student has completed. Another difference with Google Docs is you're not going to be able to compose or write anything. It's just going to display whatever video you pre-recorded and uploaded. But with the note function, it's similar where you can add in hyperlinks. Do you have, Ryan, I mean, this is kind of cool because I use the fourth slide video that you have right there. Do you have some of them that's already kind of done to kind of see it in action? I do have some, but what's unfortunate with Edpuzzle is how you share them. So you have to be in a certain network within the pro version to be able to readily share it to other people. But they're on Edpuzzle, there are already pre-published ones. Rachel asked, is Edpuzzle free and is there, is there a trial version or it, uh, what is the pro version? Edpuzzle does have a free version that lets you go ahead and record and assign, and then there is a pro version, but right now they're offering the pro version for free to most schools because of the ongoing crisis, so you should be able to sign up for the pro version. Is it doable for middle school? Absolutely. Any, any screencast that you personally record can become an Edpuzzle, so you get to decide what level of rigor is going to be involved. Sounds great. Thank you so much, Ryan. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, could you go ahead and pass the hosting on to Matthew? He's up next. Well, um, let's see. I don't need to actually be the co-host. I don't think. Am I successfully sharing my screen with everyone here? Yes, Matthew. We can see it. All right. Sounds good. So why don't I go ahead and get started, and, uh, and somebody can private chat with Ryan to help him get his uh, his uh, co-host in, <laughs> to, get the co to get the hosting back there. Um, 
So I know that there's a lot of uh, digital overload that uh, a lot of our students are having as they're trying to, to sort out all of this Zoom and the and Edpuzzle and these great amazing digital resources that we have. Um, but I'm kind of a Luddite in many ways, it's the uh, educational technology Luddite. Um, and one of the things that I would love my students to be doing more of uh, is going outside. And so we're going to sort of show uh, a little bit of an uh, interactive Zoom session that I did with a group of third and fifth graders, uh, uh, but could easily be adapted to middle school and beyond. Uh, and we start off by going out and doing a leaf scavenger hunt. And I only have 10 minutes with you, and it takes about two or three minutes to do the leaf scavenger hunt, so I'm not gonna, actually going to have you do that. But imagine if I were to instruct you right now to put down your device or take your device with you and go outside and take pictures of leaves and then upload them to our Google Classroom site or basically hopefully you have some way that you can get uh, those things from your students. Um, and then you might get a collection of pictures that look like these here that my third and fifth graders produced. Um, and we are going to go through the, the process that we often do with the, the, many of you have seen uh, used in NGSS very often is that in our chat window I want you to write something you notice about the different leaves in there. And let's have a few people just do that real fast right now in our chat window. Just go ahead and type something you're noticing about the different leaves that I'm showing uh, on the screen right now. Jenny knows the different colors there and he's got the different shapes. Uh, some people know it's symmetrical, there's different textures. Oh my gosh, with uh, 84 people this goes a lot faster than it does with 30 people. Um, uh, it's hard to see them all go by. Um, but we're seeing all these different things. So, okay, stop, stop typing for a moment here since we've got some great uh, additions. The next thing I want you to do is I want you to do what we often do when we do a notice, is that I want you to convert your noticing into a wondering. Write a question, something that you wonder when you look at these different leaves. And let's see what those look like. So why do they have so many shapes? I wonder why there's so many colors. Uh, I wonder if they were taken all at the same time of year. Um, I wonder how much water each leaf needs. Um, I see different shapes. I see things about the why are their veins different, why are there different textures, different colors. And what about the use of each shape? And we're starting to see all these different questions. And usually when we have a class of, of students, we can kind of predict what some of the main questions are going to be. And one of our students is going to invariably ask, why do some plants have bigger leaves than others? And this is a great question. Uh, and it's partly because if you look at the leaves that we had in our, in our photograph there, we had so many different sizes of leaves. And that's partly because they were collected all from our gardens. And our gardens are a little bit different than usual. Uh, different. Uh, you can put just about any plant you want in your garden, right? So how do you make it grow? And well, obviously you know that when we're planting plants in our garden, we have the power of the sprinkler. But of course, nature does not have sprinklers. So we want to try and figure out what it is that uh, affects these different leaf sizes uh, in nature. And so we need to design an investigation. And depending upon the, the grade level that you have with your students, you might uh, go about spending more or less time having them uh, plan out this investigation. Maybe you can use breakout rooms so they can plan it out uh, separately and think about what sort of things. Um, with my students, I scaffolded this uh, with a little bit by saying, how big is this leaf? And of course, on this picture here, I had all my students gave me different answers, and they're all talking about the leaf on their screen. Uh, but then when I added a grid, uh, they gave me an answer. This is an eight centimeter leaf. When I changed the grid and said each grid cell is uh, two centimeters uh, there, they can still tell me that it's eight centimeters long. Uh, we can have discussions about whether when we talk about how big a leaf is, do we mean that it's like, uh, like size A, which is from one end of this leaf to another end of another leaf, or do we talk about the width of the leaf B, or like this length of this leaf C, or maybe the smaller leaf? What do, what do we, we have to come up with some standard convention of deciding when we say how big, we need to talk about how to measure that, and we can come up with that and agree with that. So we can scaffold this, this designing process, always being mindful of the fact that we need to think about scale on here, because we're not, oh, not going to be looking entirely at, at, uh, at leaves from, from real life. We're actually going to do some virtual leaf measurements. And uh, I have sent my students out to measure at five different locations uh, around the, the U.S. here. Uh, and uh, they each uh, are going to be looking at places with different amounts of rainfall from 10 inches all the way up to 150 inches. Uh, and each uh, 
breakout room. I, I use those breakout rooms and I send students out to one particular location. This is here in Porter Ranch uh, along the Aliso Canyon hiking trail where we have an average of about 17 inches of rain. And I took about four different uh, leaves that I found there and, uh, and put those on a grid uh, to scale so that students can actually measure out the lengths of their leaves. And of course, they're only looking at one location, so they only see the leaf size and distribution in their one location. And uh, then the next thing that we do is we have them, of course, uh, they have to find a way to, to send that information to me. I can either choose, choose that uh, in a chat window. They can just type in measurements in the chat. Uh, or they can uh, put those in a collaborative spreadsheet depending upon their sophistication and technology tools available. And the eventual goal is we're going to be able to create a graph. And uh, I want to walk you through what I do with graphs uh, here. Uh, and um, so we have uh, our average inches of rain total on the, on the horizontal axis here. And that's in inches. And I always like to label my graphs with ever. I provide my students a blank graph first and then talk about averages. So over here, when we have only 10 inches of rain, I call that dry. So what am I going to call, type in the chat window here, if I've got 150 inches of rain, what adjective can I use to describe that, that far end of the horizontal uh, graph? So that's going to be, thank you, Karen, that's going to be wet. You can do the same thing with the leaf sizes. What is it when you have like a one-inch leaf or maybe a half-inch leaf? How do we describe that leaf? Somebody can type that into the chat, an adjective that we'd use for this lower left corner of the vertical axis, that's small. And then you can imagine I have to my students, even though they're all muted, okay, everybody, call out to me, say out loud, what adjective are you going to use up here in the top part? Say it out loud, one, two, three, that's big. <laughs> so we get this idea of, of doing this, and then I have them make some predictions. So if we were to think about um, some different ideas, what would this graph look like? And I'm going to give you a starting point. A lot of my students actually think that leaves help a plant collect water. So this is a very common misconception. If that was the case, when it was dry, you'd need bigger leaves uh, to, to capture more water because there's not as much water around. Uh, and then when you got to be uh, in a place with lots and lots of rainfall, you wouldn't need very big leaves because there'd be so much rain falling. So that would be one idea. Another idea is that you know what, the amount of water doesn't ma matter for the leaves. And they all have the same size leaves regardless of what, uh, what water is. And we know that one's not true. And then lastly, maybe there's something about water that helps leaves grow bigger. And so we might look at a graph like that. Then we actually look at our actual data now that we've thought about this. And here is the data from our, our five different locations that we looked at. Uh, and you can see the, the smallest, the largest, and the average. Uh, and you can see we've got a definite trend here. There's a pattern. The more rain, the bigger the leaf. So I'm cruising through things. And you can really actually see this when you start putting them side by side. Here's our 10 inches of rain, 17 inches, 60 inches. And then if I shrink it down here, there's our 150 inches of rain, our average leaves in, in there. And you can really start seeing this pattern. And in fact, it's actually, if uh, we just look at one place. So here's that trail along Porter Ranch. If you go near the creek at Porter Ranch, you see that it's not just about rainfall. Just being near the creek causes the leaf size to go bigger. So maybe we should refine our pattern to the more water, the bigger the leaf. So I've done all that. That takes a couple days. And so our third day, we actually are going to look at some, some related questions here. Um, what is the plant doing with all that water? And we know that there's this pattern, the more water, the bigger the leaf. Uh, so we wanted our students to go collect the leaf again and, and then draw their leaf, spend some time noticing the overall shape, but also noticing the details within the leaf. They're going to draw uh, the veins very carefully. And so that brings us to this question. Hopefully, they can start asking. And I'm doing this very fast, as Michelle has told me. I have less than two minutes now. Why do leaves have so many veins? And I postulate that these two questions, why do some leaves have, or plants have bigger leaves than others, and why do they have so many veins, are related, of course, by water. Uh, and so we can start having our students draw models in Zoom. And I don't know if you've ever used the annotation tool, but uh, we can say, uh, I think the plants have big leaves so that water can spin around in circles inside of them. And we can actually draw on here what that might look like. So I can actually then have my students go ahead and draw on here and ask them about these two scenarios. I think the plants uh, in a dry place need bigger leaves in order to, to get more water to survive. So what would that model look like versus the other one? And we can actually have our students um, go ahead and uh, annotate on here. And we can call on them and do those annotations. They might look at things like this. And then we're going to test this model out. I have this picture here of what would happen if a leaf had a hole in it. 
And I love this video here where we actually are going to look at what happens with this. Here's an actual leaf with a hole in it. And they have some glow-in-the-dark water here. And we can watch as the water flows through there. And we can have our students wonder what's going on. And they can notice, look at how the water is traveling to every part of the leaf. And so we end day three trying to ask this question, which of these models did our leaf video support? And in the end, we now have to, to get to the question, what does a leaf do with all that water? Well, we know that there's this pattern. The more water, the bigger the leaf. And structure, the structure and function relationship, veins carry water to every part of the leaf. So that would bring us to where we would go with day four, which we don't have time for, uh, where we'd start talking about the flow of, of matter within, uh, within plants and photosynthesis, and we'd go on from there. So that's kind of the crash course of things. Now, I have a video recording of this that I will link to our agenda so that you can see this in a little bit more detail and a little bit less crazy fast. Um, so that's kind of where we have to, have to leave this. Awesome. Thank you, Matthew. Let's have a quick reaction to that. There were a few questions okay. about how you got that grid for the, um, for the measuring, Matt. How'd you do that? I use Keynote, actually, and uh, I just took the pictures of the leaves, and Keynote has this cool feature called Instant Alpha, and I think PowerPoint has it as well with transparency. And I was just able to take pictures I found randomly on the Internet and, uh, and um, basically just uh, made those leaves so that they were just, just the leaves themselves, and I put a grid behind it. And that's my, the grid is just a table that I make. You know, you, use a, you can make a table in, in Keynote, and uh, I just put a table with little dashed lines to make it look like graph paper. So not even Photoshop, just regular, regular little presentation tool. And again, links to the slides, uh, links to those PDFs with the different uh, locations, and uh, links to the video will be posted in about two minutes. I will get that up for you right away. That's probably a good time to mention that uh, you, the, the website that we have for this is going to be getting updated as we go. So you might need to refresh that often. Uh, and next up is Dorothy. Um, awesome. Am I going to screen share? Um, all right. So for me, everybody see my screen? I'm going to do join P Pear Deck. So just for the fun of it, you guys are going to be my students. We're going to be doing some um, a formative assessment tool. And so the website you're going to go to is joinpd.com. And lovely Highlanders memorized purple avocados is what the uh, password is uh, for this particular um, pair deck that we're going to be using. And so right now I have no other person yet, but then this gets projected on the screen. And so I'm going to show a number of types of questions that Pear Deck can. It's a, it's a formative assessment that they're giving out for free for three months right now. Um, I did get the full version of it. And so it's just, there's a number of different types of formative assessments. I just chose this because it's fun and I use Google a lot and this is a Google connection to Pear Deck. Pear Deck is a Google product. And so I have four people on right now. And um, it's cute. Sure. Yes. The, that first letter, it's an L, right? L, yeah. I, I typed it on. Highlighters, memorized purple avocados, yeah. And I was trying to, hey, uh, oh, there it is. Um, I was going to do it on my show, what, it, uh, what the screen, and then I also have what a uh, presenter looks like, too. So I was trying to do both. Okay, I got 27 people on right now. Let me just give it another What's minute. the code again? I'm sorry. L-H-M-P-A. And by the way, if you say joint PD, you oh. end up joining the PD department. <laughs> <laughs> and I close everything. I, I, uh, when, when I walk around, I have my iPad, my laptop projects this. I have my phone on so I could, um, so I could, um, uh, so I have multiple devices when I'm walking around. I could control everything on my phone as I do this also. So let's start the class. 
And so it is just a formative assessment tool that I found using Google Slides. But there's a, a number of other ones. I thought this was just kind of fun and cool. So I'm going to run it. So in the free version, you get a multiple choice question option. So answer this as in a multiple choice. So I'm waiting for your responses. And then while you're doing this, I could show your responses. I, I, on, on my, um, so I have my lap, uh, my iPad on, I could see everybody's responses and, and your names, but this is what I would project to the students. I'm like, oh my goodness, you're almost there. Come on, almost there, almost there, a little bit more. And in this, uh, and, and this is in real time of what everybody is changing. So people kind of change it. So I'm like, I don't really care if you change your answers. I'm like, it's, it's just kind of a formative assessment. So he was like, you're almost there, almost, almost, almost. Just a little bit more coffee. I could also lock your screen so that nobody could answer anymore. Yeah, I know Brian has his right there. So I could lock screen so nobody else could add anymore. And then I could have a hide responses. Let's go talk to the next one. So I'm gonna stick with the same question, but I could have a number question, a number response. So on a scale of one, two, three, with being, being awesome, how's your day so far? So I could see the number of responses out of 55 right there. And as a number response, I could also see it in average. A lot of zeros, ones right there. Um, or I could have a, that's an overlay, or I could just see um, these numbers right here, like, you know, individual numbers. A million, really? A million, really? Really? A million? <laughs> that's what was throwing me off. Okay. So, the, and I got a 15 down here. Um, on my, if I log in under my account, I could see their names. But whenever it gets projected like this, it doesn't have any names or anything like that at all. So that's adding numbers. So, uh, um, you could also have a text box. We're still talking about what subject do you teach? So you could type something on it too. And so I see a lot of you guys write, and half of you guys written, so I'm going to show you responses. And science, uh, let's see, you know, I'm going to grid layout right here. So chemistry, biology, science, civic engagement. Whoa, what are you talking about? You got integrated science. Yay, chemistry. Science in general, amazing. Integrated science, biology, chemistry. Whatever the students need on set need help with. I'm like, always there. You teach Zoom techniques. Um, and so I could see everybody added, what? And so this is in real time. As you are writing, I could see the students, I could see the students write and everything too. So that's with the free version, but now with three months free, holy cow, you could do a little bit more. So what can you do? You could also do a draggable. Now on your screen, you should have a red dot somewhere there and then move that red dot to whatever. You can have up to like five dots, I think. Oops, I see a lot of chats going on here, sorry. Uh, um, and so people are moving the dots, and so this is a oops, sorry, show response right here. So everybody's like, is that kind of cool? I love it. <laughs> and you can have colorful dots. So you, there's like seven or eight colors you could use. You could use dots, check marks, um, stars or pluses, hearts so that I have a large number of other things which I, I could have given the option to. But so this is individual screens right here. And so, like I said, I could have multiple color red dots, which I should have done. Okay, but that's for the draggable for the free version. The next one is now you could draw. So with a, with a you could use your finger, with, uh, it's great on the iPad where you could draw on it. And so this is what people are drawing right now. Oops, am I in the draw function? Oh no, this is red. Oh, my, oh no, oh no, no, oh. Sorry, so I forgot to change a function on here, I'm sorry, but then um, your red dot's there. So literally you could draw on it. Um, so it's not on there, I'm so sorry. It's, it's not on there right now. Yeah, it didn't give us the drawing tools. Yeah, because I messed up on it when I made this last night. Sorry, I could do a new prompt. But the drawing's lots of fun. Oh, it is. Oh, my goodness. Let me do a new pro. Oh, let me draw. Okay, fine. Dr yeah, draw something on it right now. See, and, and on the fly, I was able to draw something. So now you can draw something on it. And here's my show responses. This is what, what everybody is drawing right now. You could do an overlay. You could grid layout. Hi, MC. So it just shows it. On mine, I could see your, your name on it. Um, but right now, you see, it's just really fun. And I did this with heat transfer. And it was just, you know, like it was kind of mind boggling when the students kind of actually understand drawing functions on it. Uh, quick feedback right there, let's see. Is that fun and great? Yay, and after I finish this up, 
if you have the full version, you could download it and send it to all the students as feedback also. And like I said, I could lock your screens. After I lock your screens, then you can't draw anymore. Oops, sorry. So right now, nobody could draw anymore because I locked your screens. And so somebody did, somebody used the annotate button right there too, because I could see somebody drawing on my screen right there. That means somebody annotated that. So clear, clear all my drawing. So I knew how to do that too. So the annotate button is different from that, uh, from the screen right there. Does everybody know that? There's an annotate button to draw on the screen if we allow you. That's another Zoom function. But this is- um, Dorothy, someone asked if you can censor the students' responses in any way. Um, not quite. You could just stop it. So it's really hard because it is, you know, in real time, I can't, I, I can't click on one and uh, get rid of a particular drawing or anything like that at all. So that is something that it's... That you so to what if you're doing it, if they have to log in through Google to do this? Yes, they have to log in. And so I would know exactly who did what. On my other screen, I call out students for not writing anything down. Okay. So actually, let me show you from... Uh, from my, let me screen share my iPad so that you could um, see, uh, let me share contact, let me share my screen. So I'm going to share my screen, my iPad screen right now. Uh, yeah, so hopefully my iPad, oh, there it is, my iPad. Um, so I'm on the iPad right now too. And then, so where's my pair deck? Uh, there it is. So this is what my, I see from my students right there. So I know exactly who's drawing what right there so that, you know, when you'd signed in, see Nicole, um, Nicole, Margaret, uh, Hin, Kelly, so I can see exactly what you wrote and um, what everybody wrote on it. So you probably would have to do what you have to do in, in normal classes is that um, you pretty much nail a student immediately. And yes. then after that, hopefully people, students recognize that you can. Yeah. And so I do call students out for not writing drawing something and those on the bottom right there. Um, you know, what were you doing, Nita? Did you, were you paying attention, Mr. Macy? Really? <laughs> Deb, come hey. on. You know. Hey, so Dorothy. Dorothy, if you click yeah. on the three little dots on the teacher dashboard, you can mute a student. So then they, oh. your other students never see it. I'm so, so sorry. Yeah. So I don't want, uh, Ryan, I don't like what you did. So I just took him off <laughs> on, the, on the other one. And then um, someone asked what the difference between Nearpad versus Pear Deck is. Um, I think Nearpad, they are different companies using, doing the kind of the same thing. Is that, is that um, there's, uh, there's Nearpod, there is, uh, uh, there's, there's a few, three or four other companies that are doing these things. And so I just chose Pear Deck just because I was using Google a lot and they just kind of, and it was just seemed like a lot of fun things. So um, I, I know that there was, uh, I wanted to check out the other ones. I just couldn't remember. Michelle says I'm timed out. Great, I didn't even talk to you about the, uh, about the other one, but okay, uh, Michelle says my time is up. Okay, one last question was um, asking if you should have students in like um, split screen. Um, sorry, the birds just flew by my window. Um, the thing that I usually do with my students is, that, is I have them exit out of full screen so they can have two windows open at the same time when I do this kind of stuff. So that's yeah. just my response. If Dorothy, if you have something different. Oh yeah, I mean, I because um, when you use full screen, I do. Yeah, I have multiple screens going on right now, usually all the time. So that's why I tell my students too. And Dorothy, can you share your email? Okay. Oh, my email is. Um, I'll, can I put it? I'll put it on the. Um, I'll put it on the other site. I'm okay. on the. You can add it to the chat. And the chat, yes. And then. Okay. Um, back to you excellent thank you dorothy uh let's all give her a reaction on that hey, one okay. stop your screen share i'm stopping right now <laughs> oh wait sorry let me get out of stop share got it. okay yours all right i'm going to share my screen um so erica are you on by any chance so erica uh, is uh, sent us her her, uh, her submission on video. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and play a short video that she made. Uh, so Erica teaches chemistry and she, she actually made two videos. I told her I'd only show the one, but she made a couple of videos for us. One is about climate change and the other about uh, kinetics using simulations. Uh, and so she's got a link here to the kinetics activities. 
I'm going to try and play this on my screen and hopefully you'll all be able to hear it. Let me know if, uh, if it's not um, accessible. I'm going to try and see if I can go full screen on this and see what happens. Hey guys, um, uh, thank you for coming to NGSS Palooza online. Appreciate you guys being here. I know this is a really tough time. Um, so hopefully what I'm about to show you is gonna help at least give you something. Um, and I'll have another one on chemistry of climate change as well. So if you're interested in that, um, feel free to check out my other one. Um, but I made you guys a link and I will make sure that this is in the right place. I'm not sure where all these things will be on Saturday. Um, but what this is, this is my um, the kinetics unit that I adopted to be online. So there's really just three assignments to this activity um, and I have them all here and this you guys will have and this will allow you to make copies of everything. Um, so let me just walk you through one by one. So the first one is the kinetics and collision theory activity, which will hopefully pop over here. Um, and it takes you to a great simulation I found. I've had problems in the past with accessing simulations. Sometimes the links don't work anymore. They don't even have the simulations. So this is the current one that I'm using for this. Um, and you're able to run different reaction speeds. So it's pretty straightforward. And um, like, you know, you kind of, you do the control and then you select different variables. And so they can see, okay, well, okay, cool. Let's do the control. What happens there? Sorry. Um, and then they can do things to compare to the control. So for example, if we decide to add a catalyst, let's run that reaction again and it'll actually show you what it does to the reaction. So it speeds up the reaction, um, et cetera. And so for that activity, they're gonna do that simulation and they're going to answer a series of questions. So what happens to the speed of the reaction when you add a catalyst, et cetera, et cetera. And it's just pretty easy to grade in terms of a teacher perspective, because most of the time it's, it's faster, it's slower, it's faster, it's slower. So that makes it more manageable for you as well. And then I have them watch this video, which if you've not seen this video, it's absolutely the cutest video out there. Um, it's how to, to speed up a reaction, how to get a date. Um, so I won't play because I'm sure it'll be like me talking over that. But it's a really cute video talking about the five different ways. Um, and my kids love it. And then, you know, usually in the class, I would do a talk back. But I, I did like a video chat back with them. But it's a really great video. And so then they can write down what are the five ways to speed up a reaction or increase the reaction rate. And then what are those five ways that also increase your chances of getting a date? It's a cute little thing, but they really like it. Um, and then ideally, just have them apply it to their own life. There's a second video as well, which talks about kind of the three components of collision theory. It's very um, on the nose. Both of these videos really have the answers pretty clear. Um, and so it's relatively easy for them. And then um, if you have Google Classroom, and I'm happy to walk you through how to do that, you can make an assignment. And, and it was pretty easy for me to grade um, because, I mean, the way I wrote it is so that it's literally, they're just writing the thing, writing the thing, writing the thing. It's a, you know, a little bit of liberty here, but most of the things are gonna be pretty straightforward in terms of what you would be expecting. That's activity number one. So then activity number two um, is a follow-up to that, especially after we talk to so the collision theory follow-up. Um, and that is this document here. Um, and it takes you to a link, a website that I found, which I thought did a pretty good job of explaining rates of reaction and collision, collision theory. Um, however, it can be a little bit long. So what I did was I made a Google form that kind of goes page by page with it. So it's like this section, and then there's questions that go with that, et cetera. Um, so I made a Google for so they don't have to do anything on this page. This just gives them access to the two things they need, the link to the website and then this Google form. Um, now I did have a little bit of trouble making this um, you able for you able to copy it. My quiz worked fine on Google form, but for whatever reason this didn't. So I'll show you what I did um, to do that. But again, it's kind of page by page. So they enter the first page, you know, just details. And then the first page is like kind of the first page of the website, et cetera. The nice thing about this is it's a Google form. It's really, really easy to grade. So once you are actually in the editor mode, if you haven't done this before, um, I'll just kind of show you the, the quick way. Um, and again, happy to walk through this with anyone who, who doesn't know how to do this um, and is new to kind of this thing. Um, all your information will be show, showing up in a Google Sheet. Um, there are ways to set up your Google form and do and have it be a quiz for you. Um, I have just learned on Fluberoo, and so I still use Fluberoo. So they'll have all your students in the order that they submitted and all their answers. 
Um, and there's a lot of great things that you can do to grade it. I I do Flubro just because what is that? it's what I'm used to. The Google form has their own thing too, but it's really easy. Uh, you go to add-ons, Flubro, once Flubro is there, and then you can um, grade the assignment, and then you can eventually share the assignment as well. So if you if you want them to know what they did well and what they didn't do well, it'll share their grades and what uh, questions they got wrong. So I'm a big fan of that. So like I said, I had a little issues for some reason. I tried like 5,000 things, and I could not get this that Google form to share with you. So what I did was I actually made a Google Doc of the questions. Um, I just literally copy and pasted from the Google form. So hopefully it'll be easy for you to copy back in. Um, so it's just a Google form of the questions and the answers that I asked. Um, so, and again, it's in a form where you can just copy it straight away. Um, so you can copy this and then you can just copy paste it in. Obviously the formatting is funky um, because I took it from the Google form. But then you can see if we increase the surface area, the rate of reaction, See the same increases or decreases those are the cases um so that was activity number two i have so many things open now i need to find my last one um the last one is the kinetics quiz now normally this is a quiz that i would give in class and i would be monitoring their devices um but we felt that it would be best to have this be more of an open book situation because we can't, some kids are going to have access to phones and can look up the answers and some kids can't so i just said you know what it's just going to be open book um, for everybody. So that's what I did for the kinetics, kinetics quiz. I believe you guys do have access to this. I tested it on my other email and it worked fine, but who knows, maybe I messed something up along the way. So if that's the case, feel free to hit me up and I'll, I'll figure out a way. Um, but it's, you know, 20 questions. Um, most of my kids did pretty well on it. Um, and, you, you know, it's open book so they can use some of the other resources that they used. So that is a quick section of what I did for kinetics online this year. And I just checked in with my students. Um, if they did have questions, I would help go over things. And I did a funny chat about the, you know, like more likely to get a date thing. Um, it's pretty straightforward and you're more than welcome to use whatever you want. It forces you to make a copy. So you're more, more than welcome to change anything you want as well. I hope that helps. Cool. Uh, I see a couple of questions. So uh, she has her uh, information is all linked next to her name on the uh, on the schedule. Um, and so if you go to that, uh, she's got links to both that video that we just watched and also uh, the, the right below that is the links to all the resources that she showed. Um, so that should be. Um, excellent. OK. Fantastic. Um, and if you want to reach out to her, I don't know. I didn't see her email on that, but I can uh, I can get her email as well. And I'll uh, share that with you as well. Uh, she's got a lot of great stuff on there. Um, up next, we've got Joshua. I'm trying to unmute you, Joshua. There we go. Am I good? I think you're good. Uh, let me know. Are you able to share your screen? Let me find out. Well, I can't do it if I do that. Oh, I need to go back here and I need to do that. There we go. Yeah. Uh, then I have to actually get to Can I present? Cool. Is it working? Yeah. Looks good. Cool. Uh, so my thing that I wanted to talk about today is uh, I think a little different than the other things that we're, we're looking at. Um, my experience is that folks that are uh, working in the sciences are some of the more tech savvy folks uh, in the uh, in the districts that I've worked in and uh, I wanted to uh, just kind of get us thinking about uh, our roles not just as how do we present the things that we need uh, learn the things that we need to do to be able to present well to our students but just also as our roles as uh, as leaders within our district so we have this uh, terrible situation that's going on that's presenting some pretty amazing opportunities for us. Um, so, you know, where we've had just a few teachers at each, you know, in each site, at least my experience, uh, that 
uh, are you know the tech teachers and they're the ones that have all the bells and whistles and are always trying new things and trying to figure out hey does this work no okay well let's try and do a different thing uh, but the place that we're at now is we have this opportunity for discontinuous change so instead of this incremental change where you know i go and i show one teacher and they you know they say oh yeah that works for me and they go and do a thing that now everybody is forced to learn how to make this technology work for them uh, in the last two weeks and i mean just this morning i mean i've learned so many new programs that i've had kind of sitting in this backlog of yeah yeah that's totally great for my students i'm absolutely going to get to that as soon as there's an opportunity I'm gonna you know, work that into my curriculum. And that's, this is that opportunity. Um, so just the things that I was thinking about is, you know, I can't just uh, be satisfied with myself learning these, these tools and learning you know, new ways of presenting uh, things and engaging my students that um, I have to make sure that if I want everybody to come along with it, right? If I wanna create change in my district, uh, I need to make sure that people have a positive experience as they go through this. Uh, the teachers, uh, you know, the students, their parents, so that when we get to the other side of this, that people don't want to go back to what we were doing before. Um, and I need to have them feel like they have some power in that, that, that this is their process, that the new things we're doing, uh, they're a part of this. Uh, and the nature of it makes it so, much more than it... Uh, you know, then kind of the normal of what we do. So in this scramble to build out all this different uh, infrastructure, if I want to take the community, you know, with me, if I want to, you know, create this pull, then there's some things that, that, uh, that I can do. And uh, so the first thing is just making sure that the goal is clear. As we've been going through this in my district, one of the things that I think that our superintendent's been good at is saying, is keeping people informed. Okay, here's what we're trying to do. Here's where we're going. Um, but it was difficult for me to put it together and to be able to see the whole of it. Right? Uh, so I needed to make this simple model so I could bring other people into it and say, yeah, so all those emails, it really means this, right? It's really this block of things that we're, that we're doing. Uh, and so once I you know, can create something like that, right? Once we have something that where people can see the whole of what we're trying to do kind of big picture, then they can comment uh, on it, right? Once they can conceive of, okay, yeah, that's the whole thing. Uh, they can participate in the, the process uh, themselves. And so for them to do that, I also need to create this sense of, of ownership with the community that we're all going to be figuring out how to do this. It's all going to be live in front of students and parents and everybody who's watching. And so I need to, you know, uh, help foster this sense of this whole new, you know, new thing belongs to us as participants in it. And the successes are all of ours and the setbacks are all of ours. And so how do we own that and then progress together through that? And then the last thing is I need to create some, uh, some feedback loops where, whether that's from parents providing feedback on uh, the process or the students creating feedback on the process on the middle process, right? Not on the little details, but on, is this working for my, my stakeholders, right? Not just, is it working for me and how do I know when I'm not there getting that face-to-face -face feedback from them? So this is the thing that I put together and it's certainly not revolutionary by any means, but it's just what I needed to be able to do to see what does that whole process look like. And I wanted to put it something together that was simple so that I was, as I've been bringing, you know, other teachers into kind of through the, the fog and the confusion of, uh, I don't know, kind of the overwhelmingness I've been getting from, uh, uh, from some of the other uh, teachers in my district asking for help. Just something to kind of say, okay, it's this, and be able to walk people through. Um, so I mean, if this is basically the program that I'm kind of working right now, and it's the work in progress, and uh, just trying to uh, show myself really, okay, if this is my system, then when I'm adding something new in, like how does it fit into the whole thing, right? I can't just optimize one piece of it and throw some other thing that's not in my direct control uh, out of whack, right? I need to, to build to optimize the whole. 
Uh, so yeah, that's kind of what I was, uh, what I've been doing this past week is trying to figure out how do I uh, bring myself up to the task of what I need to do and how do I create conditions to, to pull a community along with me so that, uh, that things on the other side of this look different for all of us. So that's where I'm at. Cool, that's really cool, Joshua. Um, so uh, do you want to sort of walk through the flow a little bit? Um, I can if it's helpful for folks. Yeah, I'm um, curious. So what we did as a district is we, over spring break, we pulled together uh, different writing teams for each grade level. So Anna Jones, who's on the, the call here with us uh, today was uh, my partner for seventh grade and we went through and uh, built basically four weeks of curriculum so teachers coming back would have something to start with right we know that everybody's going to take the pieces that work for them and change it and you know uh, make it something that works for them so we posted that to a common drive uh, for the whole district and then just took people through the you know process of okay so now I'm going to take that those master documents, I'm going to create my own copies for them. I'm going to take them and uh, kind of, you know, personalize them, make them work for what uh, my classroom is and the tools that I'm going to be using online. And then what I created for myself was, and then I have my publishable file, right? So these are all the things that are ready to go out and be turned into packets for my students that don't have access to technology currently. And these are the pieces that I'm going to post uh, to my various, you know, uh, outputs out to my students. Uh, we're working a program right now where we're distributing uh, packets that are being centrally produced out to all of our sites and then those are going to be distributed out to students for this first week. And then our hope is that over the next several weeks we'll be getting, uh, once we know who needs them, we'll be getting uh, devices out to those students so we'll get less and less uh, of the kind of inequity that's you know, that's inherent in what we're going to be doing. So the uh, packets are alternatives to the Google Classroom? Yeah, so we all sent out uh, tech surveys uh, to families to make sure that we knew, okay, who are the folks that uh, that have access to devices in their house and how many people are using those devices. So, uh, you know, just trying to be mindful of, you know, we have whole families sitting in, in their houses trying to figure out how we, how are they going to make this work for everybody in there. Uh, the one thing that was that I put in that I didn't have in my system before was this office hours. So I created a new Google Classroom page that was um, that I had all of my students uh, join, and those are my office. That's my office hours page. So I didn't want to have to answer the same question in five different classes, and so each uh, you know, day I'll go and post a section for the questions for that day. And so students will be able to, from all of my classes, will be able to go in there, post their questions, and then see my responses. And so I'm just trying to consolidate, uh, you know, the, uh, not just the questions for myself, but also that students can learn from, from each other's questions. Uh, the other thing that I've been doing more so than I was doing before is trying to pull the parents along with me. So everything that I'm like every instruction thing that I've been posting, every heads up that I've been posting for my students, the I've been posting those, sending those out through email through uh, to all of my uh, parents as well. Uh, now that we're, we're still in the kind of uh, pre-week phase, like our students come back on Monday. So just, I've been recording videos in anticipation of saying, okay, when you get this on Monday, here's what this is going to look like and here's how to sort through the, the plan of what you're going to do for the week and be able to kind of take them through uh, Google Classroom on video so that the parents can also see, oh, this is how this works. Um, and then the main structure that we're using for feedback from our students is going to be Flipgrid. I know that, Brian, you're going to talk about that later. Uh, but yeah, just trying to make sure that we have, uh, for me, it's going to be, I think, mostly asynchronous, you know, teaching for the next uh, couple of weeks until I kind of get my Zoom chops and my confidence that, uh, you know, it's, uh, I'm going to be able to do that well with students without interference. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of what uh, 
uh, where I'm at and how I've been trying to uh, again make it just something that I can bring the rest of my uh, students and teachers and parents through to say, okay, this is a plan. And now they can kind of hopefully target and say, okay, this part isn't working for me and I can help them, you know, work on improving the process along alongside of me. Nice. Well, thank you for sharing your, your sort of thought process and, and, and your process for getting information out to students and families. I really like that connection. And I appreciate the idea that this is a, a moment where, where education is changing and, uh, and not in small ways, but in uh, large, large steps. Uh, so thank you very much. Absolutely. How do I relinquish control? I think you're good. Uh, <laughs> okay. All right, we're going to turn it over to Ginny. Um, and uh, go for it, Ginny. Can you see my screen? Is my screen shared with everyone now? Yes. Okay. So um, actually, that's a good. Uh, lead way into what I'm doing, what I was going to present today, Joshua, because um, I, one of the things that I am struggling with is how do I do my online labs? So how do I switch from doing in classroom labs to online labs? And so one of the things that um, if I can, is that we've already talked about some possibilities already today. But I think that this kind of relates to what Joshua was just saying is, is as we're converting our selves to online, we need to think about what it is that's important about what we're doing. So for example, sometimes I do labs because I've just done them. I've done them for 20 years and my students seem to like doing them and they get something out of them, but I'm not always sure that I get across exactly what I want for the lab. So it's given me some time to really step back and think about it and think what it is that I really want my students to walk away with when they do a lab. What is it that's really important about the lab that I need to focus on and how can I do that using online and <clears throat> tools? And so again, I'm really trying to push for NGSS aligned labs. And so I can start with phenomena and phenomena often are easy to do online because you can share photos or videos or things like that. And then continuing to try to keep true to NGSS. And one of the ways that I find that that's easy to do with online labs is to keep coming back to the SEPs, which are the science and engineering practices, because um, they're usually a good place to start and, and for thinking about what it is that, what science and engineering practice can I focus on with the content that I'm doing for the lab that I'm working on. And obviously we need to keep our students engaged and accountable. So, I'm just going to give you a few examples of some formative assessments that I use within my classes. And I'm going to do this pretty quickly because we're, I want to keep us on time. And I do have some um, slides that talk about how to build these formative assessments if you don't know how to do that after each piece, but I'm not sure I'm going to actually be able to walk through a lot of that. And actually, I was going to set a timer for myself, but I forgot to. So hopefully, I can do this quick. Um, so, for example, one example I use is um, I do this thing where they have to, for example, I sometimes I start with a, the mystery bottle, and I was going to actually link a video to this, but I didn't have time, where they actually have um, something that I'm demoing, and then they have to figure out what's going on, and it's just a nice way to start the class. And so the, I usually do this on the first day of class with my students. And I ask my students to fill in what they think is happening. So, for example, this would be the drawing. Um, it, it's in a Google Draw tool. And what I would do is, is I'd have a template already set up. And then they can do things like, so in this example, if anybody's ever seen the mystery bottle, you, you add water, you have water in it already. And then you add more colored water and nothing happens. And they're trying to figure out what's happening. So you ask them to draw and insert like they can insert an image. So for example, um, I can search the web and oftentimes they think there's a sponge in there. So they could actually search and find a sponge and insert that sponge in their um, drawing. And when they do that, you can, you know, they can make it small and add it in, et cetera. Okay, so that's one thing. Or they can use the draw tools on there. They can make their own shape and if they think it's something kind of cloud-like, they could um, put that shape in. So that's one way. And then the nice thing about this is, is it does 
give you an opportunity for students to do this as they would in modeling because you can then do the second step and then ask them to come back to their model and see if they want to change anything. Because what we do with NGSS is we do a lot of revisions of models. So that's one kind of nice little thing to do. And I realize that I missed the first one. So another one, another way to do this is starting with a phenomenon. So I start with this YouTube video, which is just um, a YouTube video of pond scum. So I'm not going to really play it very long but you can see usually my students take pond water from the pond and look at it under the scope and this is what the things show so and it shows the you know things moving things like that so then i would do a a jam board with them which is the google version of let me turn off my video um which is the google version of Padlet and it's free. So many of you know that have used Padlet that now it's not free. And so you, you only get three of them. So I do this. And what I would ask my students to do is, is what do you notice? What do you wonder? And if, if you're on my slideshow, you can actually put something in this about what you would wonder about watching pond water under the, um, the scope. So you can go ahead and do that. I, I set these up ahead of time. I'm not sure if anybody's on my screen. I don't see anybody, but um, you can just say, you know, I wonder why they're moving. <clears throat> or anything like that. And the nice thing about this is, is that it's just like you would, what you would do in class um, with post-its or something like that. And then you can move them around and cluster them just like you would have in, in real time in class. So I, I use that as a tool. Um, so again, it's called Jamboard. Oh, so I can see that people are already asking about it. And when you go into Drive, if you go down to the bottom, there is a thing called Google Jamboard now. And actually the person that introduced me to Google Jamboard was Brian. So Brian showed us how to use that um, this summer. And I've been using it with my students. So it's one way to sh have them be accountable for what they're noticing and wondering. And it keeps them active as you're showing things. And um, so I like to do that. And so then I just walked through this as an example with the demonstration, the drawing. And again, you can use this type of tool as a way to have them make models. The thing about drawing that's different than slides is that you, you they'll each have to make their own drawing. And if you're using Google Classroom, you can link it in Google Classroom and then they'll each have their own um, example, their own template. So you make the drawing and then you download it and then you add it to another new drawing as a drawing. And that's how I made that template. So again, I'm not going to have time, but um, if you have questions about how to do that, I can show you. Another one that's kind of nice to do is, is to actually have them practice something. So here, I, I, some of my students struggle with what should really be on a graph, even at the university level. And I know that a lot of you um, see that with your own students. So one of the things that I do is, is I actually give them data. So and they, in my classes, in the university classes, I can divide them into groups and do this. But you could actually make a set of slides that just have the first four slides and then make a set for every group so that they don't have any other um, time to, to uh, I mean, so that they're not looking at other people's responses. But then you can look at the data and then they can try to, um, if you do it, if you share it, I'm on it. So what I'm, you'll see, I can actually edit and show the chart on um, what I do is, is I make these view only and then they have to copy the data and make their own chart. They can still make a chart in Google Sheets if they want to. But then they each have to respond and, and I can look at that. Um, another thing I do is, um, another thing I do is, is sometimes I have something set up like a frere model or concept map. And this is an example of one I do in my classes with biomes and they work in groups and they each get a biome that they have to type their answer in. And again, I made a template in drawing and then I added it to the uh, slideshow as a background. And then they have to insert pictures of their biomes here. So that's just an example. And so since I'm out of time, I just wanted to um, throw those out as ways of keep 
what I try to do is, is as I'm doing things with my students, I try to throw in as much formative assessment as I can, because one, it keeps them engaged. Um, the other day I was online with my students for five hours and I had three students say at the end of it, wow, time's up because I kept them busy. So it takes a lot of pre-planning, but it, they feel like they're doing something the whole time and I'm, and, and they're showing me what their understanding is. Okay. So that's my little spiel. Fantastic, Jenny. Uh, I think I saw a question or two in the chat there. Um, people were asking about Jamboard. Uh, they just wanted to know uh, how it worked. Oh, someone was saying they didn't have access to it. Um, oh, it's a Google. It's a Google tool, so I'm not sure why okay. you have access to your. Google. I think I think that's just because she has a student CSUN student account. Oh, okay. That's yeah. probably what it is. Um, but it's, possi right. it's possible that uh, districts might not have that activated for a variety of reasons, either accessibility or or just not knowing. But uh, districts can turn it off, on and off different Google tools, and that might be what's happening to that person. I think yeah. if you have a regular Gmail, you should be able to have access to it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All yeah, right. Thanks. Definitely with regular Gmail. Okay. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Jenny. Um, all right, we've got a, a couple. I put I put two back to back uh, that are both about climate change. So first, we're going to hear from Jeannie Chips. Not hey, hey Jeannie. <laughs> yeah, Je Jenny, and then Jeannie. That was good job. <laughs> okay, so uh, can you guys see my screen now? Are we good? Okay, um, let's go ahead and present this. So uh, I am doing the unit on the chemistry of climate change and um, we started out uh, with some Concord Consortium High Adventure Science stuff and I know Dorothy was going to present that but um, I do have the links to it at the end of the slide presentation so you should definitely check out High Adventure Science if you haven't seen it yet. Um, so just to give you a little bit of context at this point in the school year um, we did for the last two weeks go over the high adventure science activities um, and you can check it out in some of the last slides. But they haven't seen the Keeling curve yet this year. Uh, they did see it in biology last year and I've seen the final exam. So I know it's on the final exam, but whether or not they remember um, photosynthesis, cell respiration and the Keeling curve, that's a totally different story. Um, but at this point in the school year, normally I have them graph the Mauna Loa data and we do it on Google Sheets and it's a, a whole interactive um, data mining activity, um, but obviously I can't do that and trying to get them to do that asynchronously, I, I thought, well, I'm gonna have to change things up this year. So I wanted them to get a sense of where Mauna Loa is within the world and get them to see where they, where they gather the data um, and, and kind of like experience Mauna Loa first before they looked at the data, which I hadn't tried before. Um, the feedback from the students was that actually they liked it because they felt like, you know, they'd been doing kind of like things that were not really um, fun and exciting. So getting to be somewhere different and just look at looking at pictures was easy for them. So they liked it. Uh, so I started out with where in the world is Mauna Loa and zoomed out and tried to slowly zoom into the observatory and they basically had to answer the question, do you think Mauna Loa is well populated or is it remote? Because that's going to have implications in um, how we're gathering the data and that we had a, a conversation about that on the discussion board because at this point I haven't been doing uh, Google Hangouts with them. We've been doing a discussion board on Google Classroom. Um, so how do you get to Mauna Loa? I actually found a trail guide and some pictures that were actually from like a virtual field trip. And I had the students fill out this document where they looked through the pictures, uh, described what they saw in the pictures. Some of the students actually decided that they would uh, take uh, screenshots of the pictures and put them in their description. Um, and then they used the trail guide to think about what was actually happening if you were to um, walk the, the trail up to the observatory. So that was kind of a fun um, activity. And they got to learn some things like, um, a caldera, what a caldera is. I liked that they had um, 
some of the Hawaiian words translated to English. So I made sure to call out one of those ones, um, which was kind of interesting for the students because I know that they like to do it. A lot of my students are um, Spanish speaking. And so they like to do that when we can for English to Spanish. So to do English to um, the native Hawaiian was really um, helpful for some of the students. Um, then we talked about, okay, well, why visit Mauna Loa? Obviously it's cool to think about going to Hawaii because of course we take our students on field trips and they were like, let's go to a field trip there. And I was like, ha ha ha, no, we're not. Um, but it got them to think about, okay, what's, what's the point of visiting this one? So then we go to the Scripps Institute website and we look at the CO2 data that they have published. And I wanted them to start with just the last month, then they went through the last year, two years, and then the full record. So um, I actually had screenshot, or I had them linked to each one, and they had to tell me what pattern they saw um, at each of those time points. And then um, they were supposed to come up with when does the big picture pattern really emerge? Is it at the beginning in the first in the month? Does it happen over one year, two years? When do you start to see the big picture? And um, that's been a theme for us this semester that the larger the data set you're using, the clearer the patterns might become. Um, so again, we discussed that in the Google Classroom discussion and it was a question on their little student packet that they had to fill out. Um, and then I also had the students make a claim about whether they think CO2 levels are highest in the summer or fall. And that's an activity that we actually do during the classroom. I have them stand up. If you think the summer's gonna have the highest CO2, you walk to this side of the classroom. If you think winter will have the highest CO2, you walk to that side of the classroom. Um, but we can't do that because we're not in class. So they just reflected on it. And interestingly, the same number of students basically got it wrong this time. So I'd say about 95% of my students were thinking that CO2 would be highest in the summer. So then we take one more trip around the world and they show, I show them a video on a year in the life of carbon dioxide, which is, uh, that was in Ryan's presentation actually earlier with the Screencastify, he had Screencastified it. So you kind of saw a preview for it. I'm not gonna click on it just so I make sure that I uh, get done in the 10 minutes, but basically it's a NASA um, projection of what happens to CO2 levels throughout the year um, and then they have to describe what happens and reflect on whether they were right or wrong. So every year, this is like a big moment in class, right? Because they've stood up and this half walked to, to this side of the room saying summer was going to be highest and this half said winter was going to be highest. And it's like, oh, you were all wrong. Oh, right. It's like this huge deal. Um, but not having that experience in distance learning, a lot more students thought that they were correct. They still, after watching the video, thought that it was highest in the summer. Even if, so it's a table they answer, they might have answered in the first question that carbon dioxide levels start, it starts to get clearer in the summer. Um, but then they were like, oh, I was right. CO2 is highest in the summer. And I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> you just two boxes ago said it was lower in the summer. Um, so this was an opportunity for me because I do it on Google Docs. Um, to comment on them and tell them to resubmit after they watch the video again, um, which you can comment in Edpuzzle as well. So if you put this video into Edpuzzle, um, that's great. But for me, I actually liked having it in a Google Docs rather than an Edpuzzle. I do use Edpuzzle a lot, um, but it, it gave me a different sense of their knowledge and it was a little bit easier to interact on Google Docs for, for me this time. So um, that was kind of interesting. Then um, I pointed out, okay, well, you, we've got all this historic data, but Mauna Loa just started connecting in, or they were collecting data from there in the 50s. Um, where did all that historic data come from? So it gives us a chance to go to Greenland and look at some ice core data. So we watched another video about ice cores and gathering data there. It'll set us up for spring break where we're gonna talk about some sea ice um, and probably take a field trip somewhere else. Um, then students had to make a prediction about where we are right now. And this was probably my, my favorite part. There were a lot of students that wondered what the effects of this global pandemic will be on carbon dioxide. So really intrigued to have that conversation with them um, after the uh, break, because we are gonna come back um, and, uh, and talk about uh, the um, local urban heat islands effects and local air quality issues, so. Um, here's a, just a few links to other virtual field trips. As I was saying, I am going to try taking my students on a virtual field trip at least every other week, if not every week. Um, 
I actually had them vote in advance whether they wanted to do a local virtual field trip or a, a virtual field trip or a lab demo and they all voted for field trip. So I'm going to have them do that vote again and see if the answer is still the same. Uh, there are lots and lots of virtual field trips out there though and they're just a great way to get the conversation. Uh, and then this is a quick how I did this with my students. So this is like my transition to um, distance learning so far. So in the first week I sent them to uh, High Adventure Science from Concord Consortium and you can see the links just to remind students about climate change stuff that they should have learned in biology. Uh, week two, we did, will the air be clean enough to breathe um, to talk about air quality, what's in their air and how does it affect us. Then we did the atmospheric carbon dioxide levels and you can see what we're, what we're gonna do after spring break. Spring break's next week for us, so. Um, and then, yeah, if you wanna collaborate or chat, I would, I'm totally open to it. If you want any of my documents for any of these other things that I'm gonna be doing, you can have it all, I do not mind sharing, so. Uh, I'm going to try to jump onto the chat now and answer anybody's question. Um, okay, so, um, yeah. So you're asking you if you're asynchronous or asynchronous. Can you do this? Okay, so this is totally asynchronous. None of this was synchronous, and it was only because we're, we're like, this was week three of the um, transition for us to uh, distance learning. And I just, I know that a lot of my students aren't really ready yet for synchronous learning. Um, after spring break, it's going to be required for the students. So after spring break, I get to transition to more synchronous. But at this point, everything was asynchronous. Now, I did have the Google discussion board. So one hour a week, I would be on Google Classroom. And I just posted a quick question. Kids could answer it or not answer it if they wanted to. So there was some supplemental synchronous sessions, but all of it was done asynchronously. And then, um, yeah, so most of this um, in uh, asynchronously, yep. Do I have a link to what it looks like for the students? Yeah, so if you wanna see the student document, the student document is actually right here. Um, and you can see uh, how they fill everything out. It's a little wonky. I'm not a huge fan of the way I did the first virtual field trip. Um, I definitely wanna modify this a, a little bit in the, in the later sections, but, I always start them out with some prior knowledge. And then um, I had them go through the video, the pictures that I put on the slide for you. And all they had to do was just answer whether it was um, uh, Mauna Loa was remote or well-populated. And then they had to answer the questions about those um, graphs from uh, the Scripps Institute. And then the discussions about like each video. So if you want the student, um, document, it's towards the end of the presentation. And you absolutely can have all of it. Good. So uh, my email is on the very last slide. Please, please, please email me. I the, the more ideas I get from you guys, the more I modify everything. And I am like, take and share, take and share. Like, absolutely, just share everything. It's what you guys are doing. Like, already, I was like, ooh, Pear Deck. I, I should be using Pear Deck. I haven't used that in a while. I need to use this. And then Matthew's presentation, I was like, oh my gosh, wow. So yes, please, once you get something, like if you make a cool modification, let me know. Like, I'll make it, I'll modify it on mine too. So uh, when I'm working with my students, do I record the meeting? So, so far I haven't been because um, it's, on a, it's on Google Classroom. So it's just literally typing questions in and responses. So it's already there on Google Classroom. I'm sure Schoology probably has something like that where you can just ask a question and the students answer. Um, when we are being told by our school that we're going to record it just in case students can't be on the meeting when we do have synchronous sessions, but that doesn't start for two more weeks. Oh, Devin did a Kahoot. Okay, yes, yeah, same situation. I, I think Kahoot could be really helpful, but you're right. Some of the students might not be able to access it like live, so. Um, how am I doing on time? I haven't even been looking at Michelle. That, that was awesome, Jeannie. Okay, good. Very cool. Um, and as you said, all of her stuff is linked on the web page. Make sure you were, keep refreshing that because new stuff is getting added all the time. Cool. Very nice. Well, thanks, Jeannie. Yeah. Cool. And now we're going to turn it over to Corrine Duarte. Let's see, where are you, Corrine? I'm coming. Oh, awesome. So mine isn't really about climate change, it's more about hyperdocs and how to support teachers um, with hyperdocs. 
And so, could you see my screen? We're not seeing did it I yet. Do? Are you able to share? I think so. I think I did. Did, did I? Did it, can you see it now? No, I'm not seeing it yet. It's sometimes you have to remember to click that button on the very bottom right hand corner for share once you pull it up. Okay, let me try again. Oh yeah, you're right. It's not letting me click it. It's grayed out. Uh oh. All right, let's see what we can do about this. How about now? Try one more time. Nope, it's still grayed out. Okay, let me see if we make you a host that will solve our problem here. Oh, this list of participants is so long, I can't even find you. If you wanted to, Brian, you could just open, um, I have a slide deck in that folder I shared with you. It's called Hyperdocs for Distance Learning. If you wanted to share it, and you could be my clicker. Uh, all right, let's try this first. And then if that doesn't work, okay, how about now? Is it, uh, is it open? One second, let me try again. No, the share is still grayed out for me. I can see it, but it's, it's grayed out. I, I think maybe you can just copy paste your um, URL to the chat, and then Brian can open it. Yeah, and we we have it on the link. Oh, yeah, on the page. It's already in the page, and it's called Hyperdocs for Distance Learning. There's several folders, several files in there. Everything I wanted to share is in there. Um, the presentations there. Um, so I'll just start talking. Yeah, I'm sharing it. All right, so um, one of my, so my role is I'm the science learning design coach. And one of the things I realized as soon as they said we were gonna have to be teaching um, virtually is we have a lot of um, teachers that are not very techy. And so what were some tools I could give to my teachers to help them be able to survive in this new paradigm? And luckily, I've been working with a really great group of strong teacher leaders over the last three years. As we went to NGSS, um, our biology team was really interested in hyperdocs. So um, we learned about hyperdocs together, the teacher leader team. And this is a, a tool that's really useful and easy to put together a lesson flow um, for students. Um, so if you could click on the hyperdocs for distance learning, You can present that or go through the slides, however you want. And just go ahead, you can um, go to the next slide. Yeah, I think if I present, it's going to okay. work. Yeah. All right, and so a hyperdoc is not just a document with hyperlinks. Hyperdocs is a tool that was developed by a wonderful group of women, uh, Lisa Highfill, Kelly Hilton, Sarah Landis. They published a book called the HyperDoc Handbook. They also have a wonderful website with all kinds of training and tools about HyperDocs, and I link to that in several places in this presentation. So you want to go to the next slide, please? And so on here, I have two examples of HyperDocs that um, one I put together, one a team of biology teachers put together. Actually, some of them are in the room with us today. I saw Norma in here. Um, and so the one is a chemistry climate change one, and the other one is a, um, vi about viruses, because the biology teachers in our district thought it would be very timely to talk about what are viruses and, uh, and also about COVID-19. Um, and so what a hyperdoc is, is a um, document, and these are just done in Google Docs, though you could use any tool to push them out, um, that have a lesson flow around a subject. But more than that, it's supposed to be a very student-centered lesson flow. And so if you were to open one of these up, you would see um, that it 
they have they use the five E model. They have a, a question, an essential question, and they use the five E mo model. The one for chemistry, the question is um, about climate and weather. The one for viruses, the question is, um, what is a virus? And it leads kids through videos and interactives and um, reflection to come up with their own idea about what the answer to that question is. Both of these are introductory. They're like week one of a multi-unit unit. unit. Um, the other cool thing about HyperDocs, if you go ahead and go to the next slide, please is they're a low-tech entry point for both students and teachers. Most teachers are comfortable, you know, showing a video link or clicking on a link to a simulation. And those things can be embedded right in the Google Doc for students to be able to access in one place. It's a great organizational tool for putting your lesson together. They kind of write, remind me of the old um, lesson plans we had to write back when we were in um, learning to be teachers. So it makes you think out what your lesson's going to look like. It's, um, it makes it very easy for teachers to put some easily accessible things from the internet into a document all in one place. And it's easy for students to submit work because they're going to submit the work right in the Google Doc. If you go ahead and next slide. And in our district, um, we've just been using the 5E model. We start out with an essential question, a focus question, or phenomena. And then we use the 5E model, where you have an, um, some kind of engage activity, an explore, ex explain cycle. And that repeats several times. And then ev eventually an elaborate activity and evaluate activity. Um, go ahead. You can go to the next slide. Um, you can use it and assign it through Google Classroom, you can assign it through Canvas, you can assign it through Edmodo, you can send a link on any classroom website, you can email it to students easily, so it's highly accessible, even for um, teachers who might be struggling with technology, one of those methods I'm sure they'll be able to do. Um, students can either work on their own or they can work as a group. They can make a copy of, they, they're actually usually set it up so they're forced to make a copy of the document. They complete the assignment and activities and put their feedback into the document itself. Um, sometimes it has associated activities that are linked to it. The one on climate change I have there actually has them create a slide deck and the slide deck has a built-in rubric and stuff for the final, for the explain cycle. Um, and then the teacher can provide feedback directly on that documents or they can grade the appropriate parts. It makes it very easy to give grading and feedback and provide that back to the students. Okay, you can go ahead. Um, so some teachers make things that they call hyperdocs that are really more of a worksheet or packet. To make sure that doesn't happen, teachers need to have an understanding of what NGSS and the 5E model is. Also, Common Core Standards and ELD Standards should be embedded in it. Um, it's always good to start with a, a phenomena or a, um, perform, um, a question. Um, the content should be very engagement, engaging and focused on the DCIs. It, it should require students to uncover the learning, not to be um, told about the learning. You know, it's, it should be more of a discovery thing. And to do that, you to create the best HyperDocs, you need to have teacher collaboration where teachers collaborate on a HyperDoc, a good evaluation tool, and to really focus in on the student sense making over the process. In the next slide, I've included um, two. There's the one is actually from the HyperDoc, um, it's the HyperDoc Playground. It has an example, it's the one in the upper left hand corner has an example of how SAMR and DOK levels can be applied to a HyperDoc and that's clickable, it'll take you to that document. 
In our district, we've been doing a lot of work with Sunny Magania and the T3 model. And so I show a little picture of that there in the lower, le the lower left hand corner. If you click on that, that takes you to Sunny Magania's website and you can learn more about what T3 is. And then um, the, the other one also comes from the HyperDoc website, which tells you about what a HyperDoc is and what a HyperDoc is not. It's not just a document with hyperlinks. It should be a very student-centered, uh, reflective workflow. And on the next slide, I have some links out to some resources. And then finally, you have my contact information and stuff. And in that folder, so what I gave you really is a bit.ly that links to all the materials I have and um, things for you to explore. And that's what I had to say today. <laughs> Any questions? Awesome. Thanks, Corey. Uh Let's see. Were there some questions in the chat? Uh, they want to know if slides are available. Yes, they absolutely are. They should, the link should be on the web page. Um, and this is the uh, this is that uh, folder that you shared, right? Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And so and. Um, I, it's just a really easy entry point for teachers to be able to organize and deliver uh, rich content to student without being overloaded with um, the technology. Great. So good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Shelley Backlar, and I'm the Vice President of Programs for Friends of the Los Angeles River. And I know that I've worked with many of, of you on this call. Um, Sandra O, oh, uh, uh, we, we had a, one of our teachers was in the chat with us, so that was good. Um, what we do is we have a curriculum, it's for grades 3 through 12, and we provide first lesson and the third lesson are created so that the teachers can give them to their students. So this is uh, the LA River Past, Present, and Future. And it looks at the river with a human impact lens. Um, we look at uh, cause and effect, uh, changes on the river over time, ecosystem health, uh, what the river was, what it is now, and what it could be. So a lot of what we do um, after teachers have given the lessons in class is that we do interactives with the, with the students. So first lesson is what happened on the river from the Tongva people up through channelization of the river. And then the second step, we have a 38 foot uh, mobile uh, river rover. It's a, uh, uh, classroom essentially a gallery with um, past present and future 10 foot sections so we conduct three lessons one's a watershed overview the other is a uh, what the river was in the past uh, food web uh, cause and effect what happens if your if your environment changes what do you do um, comes up through the present with trash uh, storm drain connections with the river and neighborhoods, and then an activity where students can design the future river using a table and some, some um, puzzle pieces that we have. Um, third lesson is in class by the teacher, and then the fourth lesson is a field trip where we conduct uh, three different hands-on investigations. So what do you do when you can't interact with the kids um, when they're coming from lots of different schools and lots of different grade levels with full <laughs> full lessons um, how do we be of service to the teachers that are working with us right now so we have some online resources that we share with the teachers but we put together uh, a google doc that contains a lot of these. Some of them go through, um, I can click on that, but this is just an education blog. Um, it does. It should say, hello Shelly, but it's our, our bot from, from our Slack channel. And it really talks about what we're doing as an organization. We've got an online book club right now. We've got, you know, a lot of other ways that we're interacting. Um, but our education blog, is really 
probably the thing that you'll be most interested, I hope. Um, so this just gives an overview of what our program is. Um, and it talks about the resources that we have online anyway for use. Curriculum, Watershed Wonders is a, is a source guide for teachers, um, what our program is, and then some resources that you can use with your students. So I, um, when this was all happening, we had planned to do a lot of this work in the summer when uh, the school year was on hiatus for us. Um, so I really can relate to a lot of things that Joshua said in terms of, okay, it's showtime, the time is now, and we really need to, to find a way to continue to give these programs to our teachers. So we have some general um, guidelines here. We also have some resources, some videos. Um, Jeannie was, was helpful to me in terms of letting me know that her students really wanted field trips, virtual field trips. So we've got some videos in this document. Um, one of them is literally a quick um, look at one of the parks that we do our field trips out of. So it's called Marsh Park. And you can get a snapshot of what the river looks like there. It's a natural bottom and there's a little bit of overview just so that um, the river can come into people's homes. We talk about bringing the river to the people and the people to the river. So this is what we're doing to bring the people to the, the river to the people. Um, the next phase, um, several of a uh, couple of my staff members went out and recorded virtual river rover lessons so that those schools that were waiting for that experience can then use those clips. We're doing some other lessons in addition and hopefully we'll have those next week um, for you to share experience, um, maybe get some ideas. Um, and we're going to also be doing similar with our field trip. We do a macro invertebrate uh, lesson. And so I found a really good one um, from the University of Utah that talks about the same concepts, watershed concepts, eco ecosystem health, um, water quality, that kind of thing. Um, so this is really um, an opportunity for me to learn from you basically in terms of what kinds of things would you be looking for in the future as far as working with friends of the la river or even a curriculum that you have that you feel like could be enhanced by something that we do uh, we're a resource and we work with this team to do the ngs uh, summer institute a week-long investigation of the la river which has been getting better and better. Um, we've had two years under our belt and you know we'll see what we do this year. Um, but I'm really here just to, again, be a resource to you and learn from you and, and improve our program and hopefully provide something for you, your students and their families. And I'll just put in a plug for a lot of what Shelley's group does and is they actually also embed a lot of their work around the EPNCs. So for those of you that are still trying to make sure that your, your students are having access to environmental principles, this is a, a local phenomenon for them um, to think about. And also that our, uh, that, that we do have resources available with our nonprofits like Shelly, who are really trying to help everybody. So. This is also a plug for other nonprofits that you might want to yeah. research. Yeah. And there's a couple other plugs in the chat as well. Yeah. And many of our peers are doing um, real time lessons. Uh, we explored that option, but we thought um, this is something that we could continue our current program and then that could live on and kind of jump in. People could jump in and use it for just a virtual trip <laughs> a virtual kind of let's get out of this in a different way and explore things that we're interested in um so thank you i appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today uh oswaldo asked uh something i was thinking about as well is uh, i wonder what the effect of this quarantine is going to be on the river it'll be interesting to see that data once uh, once we get that all figured out uh, agreed 
<laughs> Definitely. We, we look forward to being able to go back there. Yeah, we look forward sure. to being there with you. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Shelly. Thank you. Uh, all right, we're going to now turn it over to Deb Brenner, uh, connecting all the way from Alabama. Am I on? Okay. Okay, great. All right, thanks so much. Um, I literally cross the Tennessee River on the way to work every day, so um, <laughs> I, I feel like I'm going to look at Shelly's resources and kind of translate them over to, to what I do now. Um, I taught for 12 years in the at Santa Cruz Christian School, um, I went through the, I got my, my degrees at CSUN, so um, I'm very, 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 very indebted to your program. Um, I'm a museum educator now, so I'm just going to share a couple things that I've used in my museum classes that I feel like would, would translate well online. And also, I put my presentation in, um, in Skies. I had it in a different format, and um, I'm a super, super big fan of Skies, so I'm super excited if James Maloney is able to share today about the Skies platform. Um, so I just put through all my things in Skies super fast, so it's not very um, polished, but um, it'll give you a chance to see it. So the first thing I have, um, so I guess I will share my screen. Does that work? Screen, okay, share. Um, does that work, yeah? So yeah, you see my screen? Yeah, that looks good. Cool. Um, so actually, I had it in a Google Slides format, but I threw it into a, um, a Skies format. So this is um, skieslearn.com. Um, and let me just show you. Um, so this is my course list. I learned about Skies through CEF, and I pulled up the um, website and I learned about this organization through CSUN um, and they have a workshop every summer so um, I really encourage you to, to look into that if they have that this summer um, and that's where I, I learned about this platform and so it lets me make different courses so I taught online AP bio um, because I moved so I taught it completely online the first semester of this year um, through Skies, and um, so I just quickly made um, a course. I just called it CSUN Online PD, and then my two lessons that I'll share, um, Bubbles and then Water Around the Loop. So let me click on this one. So the way you make lessons in Skies is you make these individual cards. And so if I click on the plus button, it'll ask, you know, what kind of card do you want to make, text, image, just different things, make a quiz card. Um, they've added a lot of capability literally in the last two weeks that I don't even know about, so I'm super excited for James to share about it. So I made um, a title card, basically um, what this is about, using bubbles to investigate the cell membrane. I linked to a, um, a, a haiku presentation, um, which I believe I've pulled up here. Um, which shows the different steps. This is already, uh, this is a, someone made this and it's great that it just shows the different, um, what you need. Um, so I put the link in here. Um, the links that are on uh, our website here, it, it's also on these as well. It's also, this is the same thing in like a Google Slides format. Um, so it's in there as well but this is an easy way for kids to navigate, I feel like. Um, so it tells you how to make the, the um, materials. Basically you take, um, stop share. So you just take, um, it's basically um, nine parts water to one part dish soap. And then, um, and then however much dish soap you put in, you put in a quarter amount of this syrup. So basically, if I use a cup like this, four and a half cups of water, a half a cup of the soap, and then a, a quarter of that, like an eighth cup of the, um, of the caro syrup. And so um, mix it all together, pour it into a tray, little cafeteria tray, 
and then you have the kids. So, so this is something that if they have at home, hopefully, you know, a lot of them are easy to get at home. Um, they can grab these little bendy straws, put four of them together to make a frame and then um, just have them play around with it. And even, you know, high school kids, I have high school kids coming here and they, they love bubbles. They just, you know, so it's fun to just play around with, um, just give them a chance to have fun. Um, and then, let's see, let me go back to sharing my screen. And then you can connect it to um, learning about the structure of the cell membrane. So um, you could um, have them look up or insert, you know, diagrams of what a soap molecule, molecule looks like, um, talk about the construction of the cell bubble. It's like a sandwich, soap molecules on the outside, a little bit of water inside. Um, talk about how the water evaporates, when the water evaporates, then the, the bubble breaks. Um, compare that to the phospholipid molecule, a soap mo molecule versus the phospholipid molecule. What are the differences? And then um, the whole membrane, the general structure of the whole cell membrane versus the structure of the soap bubble. You know, where are the hydrophilic parts? Where are the hydrophobic parts? Um, and then students can answer in this platform, students can record themselves. They can link to content, they can type their responses, they can draw, annotate a picture. It's, it's really easy, basically. So they, you know, they, they um, can, and you can pick the capability, what you want them to be able to do, what kind of content you want them to be able to add. And then you can um, control the visibility. Can they see each other's um, cards? Can they not see each other's cards? Things like that. Um, you can hide cards, so you can make cards and then um, uh, have skip, skip certain ones, things like that. Um, you can assign, you know, break kids up into groups and assign them. So, you know, um, looking at the structure of a membrane, tell us about the structure of these components, cholesterol, glycoproteins, membrane re receptors. What is their structure? How is, why is it important that they are structured that way uh, to be able to, um, to do what they do within the membrane, to, to um, aquaporins. Um, and then don't forget the fun, ha have them post their clips of um, themselves doing bubble play, you know, and they will explore, they'll be able to, you know, um, I had a kid just fill his tray with bubbles very carefully. Um, he saw how they, you know, they will form this um, hexagonal pattern, um, the, how you see hexagons in nature, um, how that shape is just so efficient um, in uh, the surface area to volume. Um, so he'll see that in the, you'll see that in the bubbles as well. Um, so uh, that's one activity that maybe kids will be able to, to get the uh, materials together to, to do at home, and then you can have a, gr a good discussion, a good activity around that. Um, the second thing that I wanted to share, so I'll go back to, oh, and the, then what, you can click on where it says code for lesson. There's a QR code, um, and then you can join. I uh, I always have my kids sign in through Google. I, when I had Google Classroom, it was so great because it just linked through Google Classroom. Um, but James can probably tell you more about how to how to make um, uh, classrooms with it. But if if they have Gmail capability, it's so easy. Um, okay, so water around the loop. This one is on a uniform circular motion. Super. Uh, uh, super easy to build. Um, let me stop share real quick. Uh, Caspian, bring me that uh, thing. Sorry, I have my kid here. He's my Vanna White today. Okay, uh, so basically, if they can get uh, some kind of hard um, platform, could be wood, uh, could be hard plastic, about a foot by a foot, um, I put, I cheated a little bit. I hot glued um, like drawer liner to mine, but you don't really need it. And then um, simple holes drilled in it and then twine um, to make a platform, okay? And then put your cups of water on there. Do you have the other cups of water? 
you have your cups of water on there. And then, um, and then can you turn it, Bubba, so that I can demonstrate? How, um, you know, what's keeping the cups on the platform? And then um, as you, as you swing the platform back and forth, you know what's keeping the cups on the platform. You talk about friction. Um, if you do the pad, you can talk about friction with the Abby pad. And then as you swing the cups in a circle, you know, why is it the water not falling out of the cups? And then you have to take a drink. All right. So um, let me share my screen again. Share. Um, so here, they can post video cl clips of them doing it. Um, they can add hints, you know, what, what makes a good successful revolution. You don't want to hesitate. You don't want to hesitate. And then also stopping the swing, kind of stepping into the swing. So uh, a lot of times they like to share what works, what doesn't work. You can make quiz questions about um, uh, defining the system. What are the objects? What are the forces in the system? What's contributing to centripetal force um, uh, at any point? You can talk about any point in the, uh, in the loop. Um, so you, you can make quiz cards uh, through this, um, have them see answers or share answers or not. You can have them, um, uh, if they're working together, um, you can have them uh, take a photo of the platform at the top or the bottom of the spin and then annotate, you know, draw in uh, arrows to show the forces acting on, uh, on the cups. Um, you can embed related activities. There's a FET activity that also talks about uni uniform uh, circular motion. So um, the Skies uh, platform is really easy uh, to to use, I think it's it, it's easy for kids to navigate. So um, that's just an example of that. And then just two um, easy activities you can get materials together to do at home, um, and hopefully have a good learning experience online. So that's all I have. Okay. Cool. That's great, Deb. <laughs> uh, we, we we had a lot of fun with your uh, your demo there. Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm wondering how parents are going to like uh, the failed uh, students. <laughs> I'm a little concerned I told about that. To, um, they can they can practice with like little little balls in the cups first um, before the water. But if you're if you're confident, it's you it works every time. So. Cool, cool. I I, I think it's worth trying, uh, especially the plastic cups. Cool. All right. Uh, next up, we have Norm Hare. Norm, I'm going to hand it over to you. Okay, great. Uh, well, it's good to see folks online. Um, see a lot of credential students and master students from the past, which is fantastic. Um, and um, what I'd like to do is like to have this one to be interactive where you're actually uh, contributing data. This is gonna be virtual investigation. So we're gonna do an investigation to, uh, together. So it's important that you refresh this screen. In other words, refresh the screen and click on virtual investigations. Um, I just put this up just a few minutes ago. And uh, so refresh your browser, uh, click on virtual investigations. That should take you to this page right here. And I can see there's already 12 people on there. And if you just be kind enough just to put your first name, last name, email, and school, we just like to get records of who's here. Look like there was 91 people on at one time. I think there's 88 now or so. Um, but this is a good way to uh, just you know connect. Um, you'll see each other's emails. Uh, this is a collaborative spreadsheet you know, that uh, most of you have used before, but we use this technique quite a bit. Um, so just, yeah, take an open spot, uh, fill it in. Um, got 35 people online already. Uh, for the rest of you, uh, you know, just try to get online and uh, give us your information. And then also you'll have the information of others, particularly in this, this time of uh, um, where we're, you know, during the virus, it's important to connect with one another. And I want to uh, extend a particular thanks to uh, Brian for organizing this um, uh, and uh, for all of the presenters in, um, and for all the participants too. It's just great to see people. 
Um, you know, I think that we talk about uh, uh, social distancing, but there's no real need for social distancing. We're socially connecting, maybe geographically distancing, but uh, not socially. So this is a good way to do it. Thanks for just contributing all that information. I hope you use uh, spreadsheets like this and Google Docs and so forth to collect information from your students, either synchronously or asynchronously. But in the few minutes we have together here, um, we're going to actually see if we can collect some data collaboratively and do an analysis of it. Okay, so um, again, thank you for uh, contributing that information. On the right side in column E, um, there is uh, links to the different resources we're gonna be using right here. There's a lot of good simulation sites in the yellow box. You'll see some of my favorite simulation sites. Looks like I, one of those I need to make more active, but uh, <clears throat> the links should be pretty good there. And um, so simulations provide a way where we can quickly collect the data and then we can collaborate to do an analysis of that data um, in uh, either in uh, synchronously where we're all on at the same time or asynchronously if that uh, is what our district requires or you know the time frame does. Okay great so right now we have uh, 57 people logging on there which is fantastic. Um, if you click now at the bottom there's these tabs. Um, we're right now in participants. We're going to do an activity which is uh, looking at pendulums. So pendulums um, you know, are a good example of simple harmonic motion, which, you know, plays into a lot of the curriculum, both, you know, not just in physics, but across the curriculum. And uh, again, you could use other simulation resources like the ones over here to um, provide uh, other investigations. So I just made this up real quick, just as I didn't even have this when we started. I just um, was making this while you guys were talking there and uh, listening to yours at the same time. So it's pretty easy to do. Um, what we're going to do is that, that uh, we're going to first, uh, it's good to have uh, two tabs open. So right now there's the one over here called Pendulum Lab um, on the Mac. If you just press the command and the, and the tab, you can open up the lab simultaneously. So now I have a, uh, I have a lab here and uh, you're going to have the, the spreadsheet up on another tab. And uh, so now we're going to move to the length tab and we're going to look at the effect of length on the period of the pendulum. So set this up um, with uh, the mass being constant, uh, gravity being constant, acceleration due to gravity being constant. And we're all going to move the pendulum back at 30 degrees. So you can click on the link and go to the pendulum lab. Um, and there's three different um, portions of the pendulum lab. There's an intro, um, and you can see down at the bottom, those are how we can get access to them, energy or the lab itself. We're going to go over to the lab itself because that's has the most features built into it. So um, what we're going to do is we'd like you to um, uh, just uh, uh, in this for this first one, you're going to vary the length and you can choose whatever distance you want. Um, unfortunately, there's only 10 measures right here. It's like we're going to go from 0.1 meter to, to one meter, but it'll still give us sufficient data to be able to do an investigation. <clears throat> Trying to teach the students, you know, that we always have to keep all of their variables constant. So we're going to keep the mass constant at one kilogram. We're going to keep the gravitational attraction, the uh, acceleration due to gravity at constant 9.81. And what we're going to do is we're going to um, start our pendulums at the same point, which is going to be 30 degrees. So I'm just going to pause this. <clears throat> and if you're on this tab now, you can move the pendulum up to the 30 degree mark. <clears throat> and then there's a little uh, tear off window here, which is the period. And so we're just going to look at the period that makes it, we could use a stopwatch, but this makes it a little easier for students to see what the period is. So if I, I start it right here, I have it on uh, slow motion here. Um, you can also speed it up if you want to. We'll do the slow motion right now so you get the idea. And then we start the pendulum. So the, uh, the little triangle at the start. The, the period of a pendulum is defined from the time it crosses the midline to one extreme. And then back across the midline to the other extreme. And then returning uh to the midline once again and so you can see for that one that was 2.041 seconds so with a length of one a mass of one and a gravity of 9.81 
you can go back to this right here and I can say, okay, well, I input that the length of one, the period was 2.041. So if we could just have you, uh, just everybody, um, enter any value you want to between 0.1 and, and uh, 0 0.09, and then um, enter your values, go back to this tab, and put in what the period of the pendulum is. If you want to get the values quickly, then just put normal, and then you'll see you'll get the value very quick. You just press period, and you'll get to that value, and just record this value. So we're just looking at the, the period of the pendulum as a function of uh, the, uh, the length of the, of the, so right now you can see that the, the data is coming in there. Um, and uh, as we're looking on the spreadsheet, we're getting measurements coming in, which is, which is great. Okay, very good. So we're getting values in there. Um, keep just Norm, just about a minute left here. Okay, great. So what we're going to do is that while we're doing this, I'm just going to um, plot this. I'm going to select columns A and B. And we'll say insert a chart. And uh, now we're going to see our chart right here. So this is your data. So you're seeing the, the data, which is period versus length. Um, I'll just cut to the chase here, but we're starting to see if I uh, um, edit this chart and I wanted to put on a trend line. So I'm going to go over and put on a, a trend line right here. So I'll tr choose a trend line. It does not appear to be linear. It appears uh, to be polynomial. And we can even put in a uh, um, R squared value and we can see that the um, when we do this, that uh, with our data labels there, and particularly choosing now the, uh, uh, that we want the equation, we can see that it's going to fit in a nice, perfect uh, um, line right there. And of course, it works like clockwork. Pendulums <laughs> are used for clockwork many times. We just go into Desmos, and uh, just to show you, I just put y equals x to the one half. Um, that's exactly what we're seeing here. We're seeing a, the, the fact that the period of the pendulum is proportional to the square root x to the one half of the length. So I set this up so you could try it with uh, various different variables, changing the mass, changing the gravity, putting the data in there. But the idea is there in a couple minutes we can collect data and we can discuss it uh, um, now at this point here, but it's an idea of actively engaging your students with simulations and collecting data online. So any, any questions or uh, my time's probably up at this point. No, that's awesome. Uh, I think we have time for a couple questions. <laughs> Deb misses your class. Yeah, hey, oh, by the way, just I'm just gonna use this as a, uh, uh, as a plug. Um, uh, many of the people that have been presenting went through our master's degree program. Um, we are starting a new master's in science education in the fall. Um, we have a great time, and it's good to see Deb there and, and uh, you know, Ryan and Erica and Jeannie and uh, former um, master's people and then Josh, other credential people and so forth. So I'll be sending you some, um, some email. I've, you've probably already received some about our master's program in science education starting this fall. If you have uh, colleagues that are interested or if you're interested yourself, uh, please uh, sign up or share the information with others. Uh, and. Uh, Again, it's, it's, it's great to be connected. And I tell you, I've been learning stuff all through this afternoon, or this morning, I should say. Um, and uh, um, I just uh, created a Skies Learn account um, and just, just when I saw you presenting, Deb. So good to see you and I and, uh, hope you're doing well in Alabama. Cool, awesome. All right, thanks, Norm. Uh, we're gonna move on to Lee, Lee Yi uh, from the chemistry department. Hello, everyone. Um, you see my screen? Yeah. Um, so uh, today I want to share uh, one of the uh, platform I've been using in my class. Um, so what I want to share is at uh, first place, uh, why do I use this? Um, and then uh, and then after that, I want to, you know, use these 10 minutes to make sure that everybody actually can uh, do this because it's really simple. As you can see, everybody has a Google slide. I don't 
because I, I tried yesterday, I was like, do I need a slide? And then I figure this is pretty easy. So I hope that after, you know, five minutes, everybody actually can do it uh, on your own. So let me share, um, you know, at the first place, why do I uh, use this? You know, I know that everybody's learning a lot of new things, right, in a few weeks, and me too. And also, you know, at the same time, you want to, you know, think about what's the best way to present um, your class and then online. So, um, at the beginning, I was skeptical. I was like, do I need to learn one more thing, you know, for uh, this new um, uh, platform to um, have my student also to learn one more new thing? Uh, turn out, um, it, it is yes. So I want to start with um, why do I, um, so when I um, first, I used Zoom. And then for my regular class, uh, before I moved to online, I have uh, in-class activities, always like group activities. I, ha I just give students um, the uh, worksheet in person. So they are working, after I introduce some concept, they work in groups and then they just you know, discuss and then uh, work on the physical worksheet. So then after I moved online, I use breakout rooms. So one of the um, um, uh, issues for me for breakout room is uh, I have 70 students and then I use pre-assigned uh, groups. My groups are permanent. So I want to keep as the same. Uh, I don't want to change suddenly during a semester. And then so one of the things for pre-assigned uh, um, um, breakout room is, is always some students that are unassigned. Even uh, we require students to sign in, uh, but still uh, some students are unassigned. So I spend, you know, pretty uh, long time to assign um, them to the groups. So uh, uh, while my graduate student uh, introduced this to me, so this is very friendly uh, use, uh, friendly um, uh, interface to use. And then one of the benefit is a student can self-assign them uh, themselves into any groups. So you just have to give them a room number and then they can go to a room. So I figure, you know, this is much uh, convenient uh, for students to, uh, uh, you know, join the rooms. Uh, and also another thing is uh, they can um, also be offline discussion. You know, uh, they don't have to join any links to be uh, together with you. They can discuss uh, with you in the class, uh, when online, and they can discuss um, uh, offline as well. So that's why I started using this. Um, and I have this red <laughs> uh, sentence. If you want, you can have everything in this one plan for. Uh, I think, you know, kind of, you know, uh, maybe now you're thinking about using this one for your lecture notes, this, that one for your activity, that one for submit homeworks, office hour, you know, another Zoom link, uh, you know. So I think this one, uh, if you want, you can do all in once. Some people use it for dance class. I don't know how, but uh, it can be a lot of possibilities anyway. Uh, so um, so now I think that that's, uh, the rest of the time I'm going to share with um, how can you do this uh, in a few minutes. It's pretty easy, actually. So first thing, uh, you can just Google. Let me share, I think, another screen. Um, stop sharing this one. Let me share another one. Uh, this is my website. So if you can just Google Discord, and then you can find the first link. Uh, it's called Discord. And then you will create an account. Uh, the account is very easy. You just need a username and a password. And then so for me, I already have an account. So if I open it, I get uh, my account opened with my class. Uh, so what I have, um, so the first thing you can do, I have my class here. And then another one is one of my students' class. Uh, I get her, uh, his permission to show you because he's doing much more stuff than me actually. So, um, so first thing you can add a server. So you can add as much as you want. So you can add a server, for example, you can create a server. For example, we can do uh, per loo okay, So you can do this and then after that, you can uh, create a server. And then um, after you have your server, you can uh, have this called invite uh, link. Uh, so invite link, you can copy it directly or you can uh, edit it because this one is going to inspire uh, expired in one day. So if you don't want it get expired, you can you know set up how long you want it to get expired or never expired, uh, and then you can have number of users. Uh, maximum I think is 100 users or no limited actually. You can invite it as many as you want. So for bigger class, uh, that's really nice, uh, and it's free. Uh, everything's free. So you can uh, have uh, this uh, link copy and then you know, send it to student and a student need to uh, also have an account. So they will, link them, uh, they will ask them to create an account and then after that, they will be joined to your server. And then after that, uh, if I get uh, to want to show you, 
uh, there are two uh, channels. The first one is text channel, the second one is voice channel. So I use voice channel a lot because I use it for um, group activity. Uh, so I want to show you uh, first, you know, you have text channel and you can create uh, anything you want. Uh, for example, you know, you want to have them to have this one for lecture notes and then you can just post lecture notes here. So uh, you can just create, let's say, uh, lecture uh, notes. And then you create that. Um, so uh, to save time, I'm going to show you, um, you know, how my student uses this uh, in his class. Uh, graduate students, so he used it a lot for different things. Uh, so he has, you know, lecture notes, he posts lecture notes, videos. Uh, you can do it here. There's a, um, uh, let me see. So you, uh, you can also, uh, you know, have students submit homework here. And then, uh, so in class problems, general discussion about anything. So he also has like, you know, <laughs> student to post doc photos, uh, group activities. So for me, I use it more for group activities. So I use voice channel, so you can create channel and then so you can have anything you want, you know, you can have a um, room, for example, called, you know, uh, dog lover, right? So you can, everybody, if you love dogs, you go to that room, something like that. But anyway, I have uh, all my students, I post a uh, PDF, there, so student can find a name, go to a room, right? So they self-select it into a room very quickly. They can be easily go to a room. And after that, I have my another um, uh, link called uh, group activity links. So I used uh, breakout, uh, I used um, Google documents. So Google documents, I just want to show you. Um, so I already set it up for my group activities. So uh, the students, uh, they are in a room, they work on the same group activity. So I have them to make a copy, uh, they uh, file, make a copy, they each have a copy. So they do their individual documents. And after that, they have to assign a recorder. So the recorder is responsible to, uh, you know, fill out this final uh, comment uh, group activity. So I, you know, sometimes grade them, sometimes I don't, but uh, uh, at least, you know, I want to have a clean copy that uh, and also all, all the group activity are in the system document. So this is, you know, validate, so for first, and then after that, uh, they have, you know, I just post each day a uh, new activity, I just update it from very uh, um, front uh, as a new activity. All right, so <clears throat> I need to go back, what else? Oh, so the last thing I think is you can always limit the student's permission for doing things because if you don't want students to put, uh, for example, some of the uh, places, like you don't want to then, uh, you can limit the permissions. Here, there's a permission. You can set, you know, I don't want them to post any messages here. So you can close the permission of, for example, uh, you know, send messages. So you can modify that. So uh, for some of the channel, um, you know, they can have free discussion, but some of the channel, they cannot do much is, you know, you are the person who uh, have more uh, rights on that. And then you can save that. Um, what else I have? Um, to go back. Uh, another thing is, uh, so if student um, in a video channel, so after they go to a room, they chat by themselves, right? So in the room. And then it's very easy. You can create, you know, for example, your office hour here, you can have a main class. So if they have any issue, they can jump between different rooms and then come to call you, or you can do uh, go to all different rooms as well. Uh, so uh, one of the things I've done is I try to um, combine uh, two of the rooms two together because, you know, if you have 18 rooms to manage, I want to make sure every room I have some time to visit during my class time. Uh, and then so I, you know, make sure that I join every room. Uh, so I have nine rooms. Uh, I make sure that, you know, I get, I go to each room to answer questions. And then they, any of them can jump into my office to ask me as well. So I think, you know, this is a very friendly use, um, uh, friendly um, interface and has not much uh, limitations on number of users, you know, and then very flex, uh, flexible uh, for, um, uh, for using. So I've been, uh, actually liking it uh, a lot. Did not regret that I spent, you know, uh, my extra time to learn this um, print form. All right, that's what I have. Uh, Thanks, Lee. That sounds really useful. 
Uh, I haven't tried Discord, but it, it looks like it's got a lot of functionality. I, it, it sounds like it gets blocked by some of the districts. So you'd have to check oh, really? and see if that's available. Um, uh -huh. Cool. Uh, excellent. Um, all right. Uh, we have a late edition of the schedule. Uh, James Mone is going to tell us a little bit about the uh, Skies Learn program. James, are you able to share your screen? Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm going to press share, and it says you cannot share uh, while... Oh, Lee, can you turn the sharing off on yours? Oh, sure. Yeah, sorry. Should I stop sharing? Okay. And so now I'll press share, and I'll share my desktop. Hi, everyone. My name is James Maloney. I'm one of the Caltech alums that co-founded Skies Learn, which you've seen uh, several of the presenters use. I just threw together a presentation here. Can everybody see this? Can you see that, Brian? You're yeah, I see it. Looks Great. Good. Okay. So, um, so I, I just made a quick uh, uh, card here. The thing about uh, Skies is you have this you know, table of contents and teachers like it because you can make folders. And so, you know, folders, we see like um, middle school, high school making sort of chapters, topic one, topic two, ETK, you know, uh, K5, uh, we see them making subjects like ELA, lesson one, lesson two, math. And the nice thing about Skies is you can easily just decide, can they still post or can they still view? And so you can see like you can lock down past work, hide future work. Um, Skies is really the only tool out there designed for teachers to make lessons. We really focus on lessons, helping the teacher get superpowers for lessons. And so uh, some of you guys have been seeing this from the uh, teacher's point of view. I'm also going to show you the student point of view. So it's like, how do you feel? A student can say, you know, uh, I feel pretty good. And, um, and then when they save it, uh, you notice that it just pops up there next to it. So if, if other, other students are posting, it's just gonna pop up um, and so uh, uh, next to it. And so like uh, here you can see now three, three students have posted. Now uh, I would never want a teacher to have to go, you get a four, next, you get a four, right? That takes a long time. Um, uh, and so uh, you can easily spread things out and share things, but uh, we made a new uh, grading panel so that it's very easy for teachers to see everything and just say, you know, I wanna grade everybody a four or a 90%, and um, you can also get feedback. Great job. Skies tries to save you time, so you'll notice there's a paste button here, because the last thing that you did, Skies thinks is the next thing you wanna do. And so when I go back here, I can spread this out and see like, oh look, I've already graded all my assignments and given everybody feedback. And um, we support collaboration. You know, We work with ed psych PhDs. Uh, Professor Chang actually uses uh, Skies to teach his secondary education courses. Uh, UCLA professors use it for stem cells, but it's easy enough for ETK. So, um, you know, here's our permissions. This is all you have to do right here. If you want to give students more permissions to like, for example, annotate on a worksheet, um, you can just do that here. And so now if, if a student wanted to, you know, they could, they could go back and they could edit their card and they could do something like add an image of a sun. And, uh, and so I'm just going to, just going to do that and, um, and show you how, um, you know, now, uh, that, uh, oh, look at that, Grace, Grace added a picture of a sun. Now this, you know, number is yellow because uh, I need to regrade it. It's in my regradable work. So let me quickly give you a four and, and say like, you know, nice image. Um, we also be, give the ability to annotate and give voice, voice feedback because um, we want to be really student uh, and teacher friendly. Um, some of you guys use Google Classrooms and different things. That's awesome. Um, you know, I love that too. We use Google Classroom all the time, like post your assignment uh, below and because uh, you've already heard about how students can log in Google and they know who you are Then the students can come along and just um, when they when they paste it What it looks like uh, for them is something like this. They just paste the link. No big deal Skies is smart enough to know what you're trying to do that you're trying to share something um, Teacher work is below so that students can reference it But if, if it was a student it looked like this and I could be like, oh look, they're posting their assignment Let me click on this and see what they did Okay, like they typed some stuff great and, uh, and then I could go and grade it. So um, teachers told us that they love Google Classroom, but it turned their stack of um, uh, papers into a stack of files and the skies it will um, organize that. And you know, the nice thing about skies is that you can come along and just you know, do anything. They told us we should put everything in one place. Teachers taught us about cognitive load theory. Um, and so like, if you wanna add a video, I'm just gonna do, um, th this would be if you wanted to do audio. Hi everyone. And teachers were very adamant about wanting speech to text, but you can turn it off or talk to it in another language. And I'm just going to um, show you what it would be like if I wanted to add a video. So I'm gonna do a camera video and say, hi everyone, this is James. I'm happy to be able to help you with Skies. If you have any questions, here's my contact info. Um, and so I'll just put my contact 626-905-1336. And, um, and also put my email, james at skieslearn.com.
Um, so Skies is only a few dollars per students per year, but we don't care if you guys use it right now. Um, principals never uh, have any problems paying for Skies for the teachers that want to use it um, uh, because you can do so much and also because so many supports. So a lot of SPED teachers and ETK teachers use it because it's so user friendly and uh, because it has so many um, supports. Like for example, if I wanted my supports to be able to access my lesson in other languages, for example, Spanish, I could give them permission to the Spanish flag and it translates everything contextually using all of your lessons and what the students have been typing. So they can actually see what each other's typing. Um, you might say like, yeah, no big deal, but actually right now with all these students at home, sometimes students can do a lot better if they have a grandpa you know, that speaks uh, Japanese, if you give them access to Japanese so that they can you know, help their kids learn uh, how to do it. And so um, it's very easy to post video assignments. And then like we said below, if you just press this button, now students can, can respond. And if you want them to take a picture or a video or tell them what you think, you can just do that. And um, with Skies, we, um, I'll just pretend like I'm making some lessons here. Like if I'm making uh, you know, subjects for uh, like science. Um, some of you guys have been uh, you know, putting videos in. Um, you know, here's a video I, I have. Now the problem with some of these videos is that um, you know, it takes kids to like the YouTube and then they're messing around. We have these generators which generate quizzes for you. And uh, if I just paste this here, then um, you know, the, um, the students are going to have a, uh, a video of my card. So it's embedded. I'll just turn it on so they can see it. If any of you guys wanna like check this out also, like you can feel free. I'm gonna take the code and I'm just gonna copy the code into, uh, into the chat. And, um, and, uh, and uh, so, so let me just chat this to everyone. Uh, here's the code, enter code. Um, and then also like the nice thing about skies is that um, we've also got links down here, these copy URLs. And so you can just share your URL and because it's so easy to, you know, just kind of give students permission on and off. Um, you really only have to share one URL. Uh, LUSD teachers love this because it's also integrated with their Schoology gradebook. And so, um, you know, teachers in, in, that use other gradebooks, they don't use Schoology. Um, you know, they can't just press one button, but even our teachers in Pasadena say, oh, this is great. It's so easy to grade and to see what, you know, students are doing. And then I can just um, download the grades and copy that column into my grade book. So, um, uh, and uh, yeah, so um, yeah, so someone just asked about Schoology. Yeah, so exactly. You can just press one button. And also when you don't want your students to see stuff, you can just click this to see how it says hidden. Um, you know, we have differentiation, but I can just hide things on and off for my students. And so if I go over here to my, you know, my student view and I see, oh, look, uh, we're collaborating so I can see what other people said. And then I can also like post a video response. And so I could tell my, my teacher, I could say, thank you for giving me this resource. And then I could just paste that. And then as a teacher, then you're going to be able to hear what they said. Thank you for giving me this resource. So it's just very quick. It's very fast. It's very easy. We put everything that you want to do in one place. We make it easy to share. And, you know, when you go to Skies, um, you know, there's five different ways to log in. Just press continue with Google. You never have to remember your username, but we also have um, various integrations, Clever, our own scan badges or login, sign up. Um, feel free to use Skies. Um, and uh, Skies, the nice thing about it, it just logs everything for you. You know, when I go back and I look to see like, when did, when did you do something? I can actually see, oh, Ada did this seven minutes ago on April 4th at 1141 AM. And if she changed it, I could see when she changed it. Um, sometimes people want to print stuff out. Sure. I understand that we have a page view with a lot of settings. And so, you know, here you can, you know, show Ada's work or all the work and use these settings to print things out large or small. So sometimes parents like to, you know, have their kids do work on paper and I get that. Um, and so, uh, if that's the case, what we uh, recommend is that, um, a lot of you turned on the option to annotate and also the option for um, taking pictures so they can take pictures of, um, uh, what, uh, what they've done. Um, so I have, I have two minutes left. Uh, maybe I'll just pretend like I'm importing a worksheet. So, you know, if I'm uh, over here in, in, my, um, in my math folder, I'm going to import something. Let me just, uh, you know, we have a lot of import. You can import the file. Um, I'm just going to go over here to my, um, my folders and say, oh, here I've got this thing on fire on climate change. Let me just drag it here. Always choose separate pages if you want students to annotate the work. And remember, Skies is going to try to help you out. And the last thing you did, it's going to think that's the next thing you're doing. So if I, if I say I want them to annotate this and I want them to either be able to annotate or take a picture, then when I turn this on, then Skies is going to um, automatically think that's the next thing I want to do. And usually, you know, the sentence starter is left blank unless you, you know, want to have stuff on the card when they start working on it. 
And so now if I go into uh, my subject and I go into ELA, oh no, I said math, right? I did a math lesson. So I can see the math lesson. And if I wanted to now, I could actually annotate. And, um, and also what we just released is, um, is, is chat also. So I can, I can also put comments. And, um, and so the thing about chat is, um, and I can also make an explainer video. Hey, boys and girls, look, this is what I want you to do. I want you to do this. And then I want you to do that. And uh, so some of you might know explain everything. So we just put that into a card called the explainer card. And, um, and so now like if, if the students actually play this feedback, they'll actually be able to see me, hear me, watch what I'm drawing on the screen. And we saw some first grade teachers do that to explain teach to students what to do. Hey boys and girls, look, this is what I want you to do. I want you to do this. So, um, so that, that's Skies in a nutshell. It's very easy to use, very user friendly. And if anybody um, you know, wants to use Skies, um, we, we don't mind if you use Skies. We're, we're offering, um, you know, free, free, free support and, and, and lessons during this time. And then right here, down here, you notice that we've got a chat. You can, you can ask um, for, for help. Um, so just please send me an email. I put uh, my, my name and um, I also put it in the chat here. James626905 1336. James at skieslearn.com. I'm sure you guys all know we're going to be in this like past the summer. April's not coming around and they're going to be like, everybody back to normal. So we need to know how to do um, synchronous online instruction so that we don't leave the gap of, um, of students behind uh, a generation. And so, yeah, here students can raise their hand. And over here you can say, oh, look, a student raised their hand. Oh, let me call on them. Uh, Ada, talk to the class. Now you get feedback because we also use Zoom, but I can call on them one-on-one. -on -one. Can you hear me, Ada? or I could call on her and then she can hear the whole class or I can speak to everybody. And so with this now, um, synchronous communication and synchronous instruction is easy. I wanna stop there just so I can take a moment in case anybody has any questions. Thanks James, that's really cool. Um, I'm gonna go give you a hand. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, preempt the questions for right now uh, cause we're about to, we're gonna break in just a minute and if you can hang that's around fine. and people can ask questions in the discussion room, I think that'd be perfect. Um, Let's see. Um, all right, so I'm going to, I wanna see if I can. Uh, Do I stop sharing? Uh, yeah, uh, it, I'm gonna, I, I think I have the power to actually make you stop. Okay, uh, I think I stopped. Us, using my, uh, using my uh, host powers here. Uh, cool, all right, well, I'm not gonna take a lot. Uh, I just wanted to talk about Flipgrid for just a minute. A lot of you already know about Flipgrid. Uh, Flipgrid is a tool that allows people to to basically have discussions. It's like a discussion board, except instead of typing your responses, people can record videos. Um, and it's, it's really that simple. Um, I, I like to plug it because it really is critical that students uh, continue to be expressing their ideas. You know, we're teaching online and a lot of it is asynchronous and students don't really have that connection. But one of the things you can do is if you see a video of another student talking, if people are responding to your video and things that you've said, uh, that can really sort of build that, that connection up re uh, really well. So uh, I, think, I think Flipgrid is a great tool. And as, uh, let's see, Joshua was saying a while back, these are some tools that are really critical to use now, uh, and things like Skies and all this stuff. Uh, but they're going to be really useful when classes get back. Just because we're face to face doesn't mean you can't use all these great technology tools effectively. Um, so I have a task for you. The best way to learn about Flipgrid is actually to try it out. So if you go uh, to the web page and click the try it out button link right there, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to use this as a chance for you all to give us feedback. We've been talking at you for almost three hours now. Uh, we want to we want to give you a chance to respond back to us, and we're going to use Flipgrid as the way to do this. So if you click on that, it'll take you to my grid. By the way, this is the the educator uh, view as the as the instructor. So for example, you can see what my class did on Wednesday night. We were all just we wanted to check in on what we were doing, and so you can see my students. Uh, oh, got to log in. All right, so uh, Flipgrids, if you've never seen them, they look like this with little one, two minute videos. And then you can see here's a video and then we've had three people respond to that video. And you can see there's also things you can do. They've got a lot of uh, ways to modify your video. If you don't like to have your face on the screen, you don't have to have your face on the screen. Uh, you, can, uh, you can put your cat on the screen and things like that. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility, but it just gives everybody a chance to respond. So go ahead and click on the try it out link. Um, and 
All right. Uh, and go ahead and let me see, what does it look like for you? I think you can just add a response, a big green plus button. Go ahead and add a response. And if everybody could just respond and uh, thank the presenters for all the great work that they did, maybe highlight one or two that you thought were really cool. Uh, I think that would be awesome. Once you've posted your, your Flipgrid, um, then come on back and we can break out into our discussion rooms. You can ask some of the presenters questions uh, and comments like that. Uh, so I'm going to sort of I see there's a bunch of stuff in the chat here. Let me see if I'm missing anything. Well, oh, uh, Lee points out we got four rooms for discussion uh, and we have set up. So the first five presentations are going to go to room one. The next five are going to go to room two. Uh, oh, wait, what, what are their rooms called? Uh, the DCI room, the SEP room, and the CCC room. And you can see on the bottom of the main page has that. All right, so, but your assignment first is to post something on the Flipgrid, then come back to the discussion room and chat with the presenters, ask questions, get links, et cetera, et cetera. Sound good? And so I just want to um, thank everyone. This is Jenny for coming. Um, Matthew posted a, uh, a survey. We really, really love your feedback on this. If you feel like this was something that was valuable to you, we could try to um, set this up again um, in a couple of weeks even or something like that. Um, and we want to value your time. So we're going to sit in the breakout rooms or, you know, the rooms for a few minutes, but uh, don't feel like you have to stay on. We realize you've been on for three hours with us. Uh, like I said, with my students, time flies when you're busy like this. And so I, I hope everyone got at least a few nuggets of things to do today. Um, and thank you. So let's give all the presenters a nice big uh, reaction there. Hooray. Well done. Thanks to everybody that came out and, and connected and we're, we're looking forward to chatting with people and everything and looking at your flip grids. Thank you for checking out the first ever online science learning virtual Palooza. The CSUN Science Learning Collaboratory is a com is a group of faculty and uh, teachers at Cal State Northridge. Um, this event was in place of our usual NGSS uh, Palooza that we hold every year. Uh, so we were virtual this year and I thought it worked out very well. So I want to thank everybody who participated, all the presenters and everybody who turned out and you for listening to the recording. Uh, stay safe and good luck with your teaching. <laughs>